even though he's probably only trained at hooker and halfback, he's watched. He knows what the system is, he's observed what everybody else's role is, because I'm a utility, I've got to know just in case he knew how to perform his role. The product sells itself, the game, but obviously the experience of what the Warriors have been able to create with the fan base um, that brings and attracts people to it, who obviously had your mate there, the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like... Kia ora whanau, yes, welcome back to another beautiful episode, Round 17 Review. Ephraim, Dills, Willie and myself, how are you guys? Well, isn't it? Yeah, all good, been a good week. Yeah, pretty all good. You guys might be asking out there, you might be asking out there. I did say last week that these guys will be in Samoa. i got no idea why they're still here, so Dills, bro, tell us why you're still here. Yeah, no, our, uh, our flight's got delayed, so we're now delayed. leaving on Wednesday. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So for the audience, the gist is me and Ephraim, we do a lot of production stuff on the side. So one of our next things is doing a little doco in Samoa. But, uh, you know, we're trying to bring you fresh content every Monday. Beautiful. No matter where we are. Because I, like I think it. next week yeah. we, we will be in Samoa, but also... Yeah, we're going to be um, yeah we're gonna be all over the place next, ne next week. So um, keep watching, guys, because we're going to be doing this remotely. And uh, we've got a mean crew here that can do things from wherever they are in the world. So um, Where are yeah. you going to be? If, um, uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to be in Samoa. Yeah. Ephraim's yeah. going to be gonna in Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in Bali. And where are you going to be, Willie? <laughs> Holding it down, where? <laughs> where, Willie? The mighty Fungalay. north. The Fungalay. mighty Fungalay. north. So Willie's, Willie's going to be holding it down in the mighty north up in Whangarei. So, um, yeah, this is going to be our show next week. It's all going to be done remotely. So, mean as. Anyways, there's lots to cover in this show. We've got the massive New South Wales win in Melbourne. Uh, Ethan will be happy with that. So, that's a massive game. We've got, obviously, the Warriors game and all the weekend's game from the we all the weekend's games coming up here on the show. So again, always, I thank you so much for your support. Keep liking our stuff, keep subscribing so we can bring, bring the beautiful game of rugby league to your eyes and ears. Anyways, Ephraim, as always, bro, kick us off with what's going on. Let's hop straight into the news, eh? <clears throat> so first up, we've got uh, <laughs> Satili Tupanua is uh, leaving the Roosters. So basically back when David Fafita was meant to be leaving the Titans and the Roosters, they were like, oh, we signed him. And then he backflipped. They had told uh, Satili that he could leave. They're like, oh, you can go talk to other clubs. And now it seems like those clubs have been talking to him and he's likely to leave uh, the four clubs that have showed their interest as the Bulldogs, Dolphins, Sea Eagles, and the Knights. Seems like the Bulldogs are the favourites. Uh, where would you guys like to see him end up? Uh, yeah, I think this guy is a versatile player, great back rower, but I also saw him play Sin on the weekend, so he can play pretty much anywhere in those back lines. Like him at, at back row, though, because he's a tough, strong carrier of the ball. I, mean, I guess there was a bit of a roller coaster there at the Roosters in that time. I think Angus Crichton was in a similar position as well. But again, I guess on the back of his form and what he's been able to do for a state, I think they're going to put a lot of their money in towards him. And Satili's most probably going to be one on the market that's looking around. And I think, you know, I'd love to see him go to the Dolphins. Um, I think, you know, as, as well as what they've already got and where they're building and what they have there with their young development and the kids that they have in their team, I think it'd be a, a great addition to the, to the Dolphins. Yeah, it's, it's when he came on, he was a young prospect with a bright future. Through injuries and other reasons, he's uh, not been able to cement a starting spot at the Roosters, and they're probably seeing that with some cap space becoming available, they need someone in. And they're a team that, you know, they go after big names, they go after superstars, as they did with David Fafita. But it's a great opportunity for him to go somewhere and be the starter every single week. And I get going to the Dolphins, going under Christian Wolfe, who was his Tongan coach. He's played under him before. They understand. They know each other. And for the same reasons that Blair, he said, I think the Dogs will be a good fit. They're a, they're a team on the up for the future. And if he's able to go there and if Preston on the on the right side and if he plays on the left-hand mm. side, you know, they, I know they've got kick out there, but he showed he's got versatility. He was very, very good at centre on the weekend. So um, whoever picks him up, wherever he goes, he's going to be a wonderful player. And I just hope for his sake he goes somewhere where he can really show his talents week in and week out. Mm. 
Next up, uh, Jordan Pereira is unfortunately being forced to retire due to his neck injury, uh, which he sustained playing for <clears throat> the South Logan Magpies, Broncos affiliate. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't remember watching him ever play because I wasn't yep. tuned in back, back in 2022 like I am now, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard he's a, he was a great player, and it's you know it's sad when you have to retire forced yeah. by injury. Yeah, good a good good winger, um, carried strong that that smaller body type uh, shape when it comes to uh, wingers, and you know similar to Brian Tall in, in stature and size. Obviously, I think Brian Tall's a fair class above him, but it's a it's a sad day for someone that has to retire because of a medical issue but again that that nerve damage i think it, what they're saying is it's becoming a thing i think flegler's got something similar um and, and fingers crossed that he can get back and get some feeling back in what he needs in his shoulder and be back on the field but yeah i guess when you look at i guess long term for your for life after football this is most probably the, the right decision that he's made um it's disappointing you lose someone at such a young age to the game 31 still young in the game of rugby league and um, had some high hopes coming through the grades. I thought he was really good in, in NRL when he was playing. But then, of course, got an injury, and this is what's, what's happened now. He has to finish up. So, um, again, you know, congratulations to him for his career. Yeah, you can't help but feel for him. Every player wants to go out on their own shield. They, wants to go, they want to go out on their own terms and be able to decide when it's their time. You know, but sometimes, unfortunately, the game can be cruel and injury forces you into that. The positive for Jordan is he's still young enough to go into an area off the field that he can really flourish and he can apply himself to an area and look after his life after football now. And your health is, is the major priority in life, regardless of football or whatever. He's got to try and get himself healthy. You can't get any worse by playing the game. It's too dangerous for him, and hopefully they are able to fix the nerve damage that he's got, and he can have a healthy, prosperous life after football now. And all the best to Jordan. Yeah, good luck, Jordan, with your future endeavours. Um, next up, uh, last week we talked about Luke Carey's going to the Catalans Dragons uh, instead of retiring. Well, he's being joined now by Nick Kotrick, who's... Uh, Signed a three-year deal starting next year. So, man, I didn't see that coming. He, he seems like he was pretty settled at the Raiders, but he's off to join Luke Carey now as well. Yeah, not a bad signing. I think Nick Kotrick's a, a great player. Um, I guess they just keep adding to their, their stock, the Catlin Dragons, and there's obviously a attractiveness over there for some of these players to go over there. But, they, again, they're not signing just anyone. I feel like they're signing quality players that keep pushing forward. So, um, yeah, Big signing for the Catalan Dragons, Nick Kotrick. He'll do a good job. He's he, like, I think he's solid at, at the Raiders at the minute. And yeah, really well. he has been. He has been back half of the season. He struggled to get in the side early doors mm. this year. You know, a couple of years ago, he was in Origin contention. Yep. And the team was flying, making grand finals. Um, he decided to go for better money at the Dogs. That didn't work out. Come back to Canberra, we was. Expected that he would kick on again, but that quite hasn't been the case. And Ricky Stewart's decided that there's an opportunity for us to move on as well as a club. They're in a bit of a hole at the moment, the Raiders. That's quite commonly known. So an opportunity for Nick to go over to France. Beautiful place in Perpignan to live. They've attracted some big, big names in the last couple of years. They had Sam Tompkins there, who's just retired a little while ago. Um, Mitchell Pearce mm -hmm. from the Roosters went over there. was very, very good for them. So they've, um, they've got some money. They've got a very, very uh, wealthy owner by the name of Bernard Guache, who's a butcher in, in the south of France, who's got a lot of money and he invests a lot. He played at the Dragons coming through, so he, he loves the club and he's, he's willing to give back what he can to help the coach, Steve McNamara, get the team that he, he wants to put together. So, yeah, I'm not really surprised that he's going to a club like Catalan. It's a, it's a beautiful place to live. You're not far from Barcelona and... You're in the south of France where the weather's beautiful. It's a little bit different to being in the north of England. So he's still playing in Super League. He'll earn a good crust and be able to still play at a high level. On the Raiders' side of this, obviously he's one of their longest-serving outside backs. They've had a lot of outside back turmoil, I guess. They've, a lot of changes have been going on throughout the season, you know, with uh, guys like... 
James Schiller, Albert Hopuare, uh, Matt Tomoko is probably one of the like solidified players there, but not a lot has been working there. What what do you think they have to do? Obviously, shipping him off, maybe giving chances for younger guys. Is that the plan on the outside backs for the Raiders? Yeah, they've got a real strong New South Wales Cup team. Um, yeah. you know, the Warriors New South Wales Cup team played them. I think they were sitting third in the competition and Warriors about fifth and Warriors have now snuck past them and got a good solid win against them. They've got some great young talent down there and outside backs quite similar to the, the Matt Tomoko size. I think they've been known for either having really tall, big front rowers and that's for, for when I was like since I was playing and, and now kind of got the same built of outside backs as well. So they're obviously doing really really well down in their their pathways, especially in New South Wales Cup. So they may be looking towards the future. Again, we've seen their halves come in, young halves come in, uh, and they've been able to get a job done. He's, Ricky's put some trust and faith in those guys. I'm guessing the same thing's going to happen with some of these outside backs, these young centres, wingers coming through in the lower grades will most probably get a, get a chance through the preseason and see if they can excel in, in the NRL level. Yeah, I think that's what Ricky's doing. He signed a new contract himself. And I think he's in the rebuilding phase and getting some of these young guys through. Josh Papali'i, how long's he got? Mm. Not too sure. Um, Elliot Whitehead is finishing up this year. Um, looked, I think he's going to go to Catalan as well. And that's the story that I'm hearing. Um, Jordan Rapiner, not sure how much longer he's got. So, yeah, they're rebuilding and looking to the future. And the young guys that they've brought in, the Ethan Stewart's, the Kaya Weeks, the Matt Tomoko's, you know, they're going to be the next leaders. They're going to be the ones to bring them through. So, yeah, I, I think uh, Ricky Stewart's got an eye on the future and investing heavily in, in the Cup squad and jersey flag and SG ball underneath. One more thing on the Cup squad. Obviously, I, I didn't watch the oh. game on the weekend, but something big happened, didn't it? Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> wasn't was a pretty sight. Good old Corey Horsburgh's back out there in, in the game and old redhead fella just loves getting amongst it and... Things just boiled over a little bit in the game and he threw a couple of punches. I think there was a stage there. Jacob Laban just copped it, two on the chin and smiled and kept going, but got put in the put in the or got yeah. sent off. Both both Jacob Laban and Tom Ali got sent off in the game and so did um Corey Horsburgh. So there was three red cards. I don't I still don't understand why Jacob Laban got sent off, um, because he was the one that copped <laughs> two to the chin and but again, Horsburgh has been around for a while and he's he's known for these little brain snaps and I think that's what got the better of him on the on the weekend. But mate, it was a, com- a competitive game. Uh, you know, they had it was a big game. The club the Warriors, New South Wales Cup boys knew it was gonna be a big game. And and the Canberra Raiders are a great quality side, so it was always gonna be a fiery match and yeah, some things got out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll move on to uh, Stefano Utoikamanu uh being free now to talk to other clubs, the Tigers have basically let him have his wish of oh. going and shopping himself around a bit. But they have told him, you know, you can look for another club, but at the same time, we're going to be looking for a player to replace you if you're going to be doing that. So they offered him that $4 million over five-year contract. That's still out there right now, but you never know if he's going to keep looking around. It might get withdrawn. And I believe it's the Dragons or the Raiders have offered him a $4.5 million uh, deal yeah. over the same time space. So what, what do you guys think is going to happen with him? Uh, I think he's going to leave uh, because if he wanted to stay, you would have re-signed already and, and not have to, um, have to go through this situation. The club's pretty much... I'm guessing they're giving up because they're saying we're going to go looking as well, which if a player comes to you and says... I'm not going to take the offer you're going to give me. I'm going to go on the market and, and see what I can get. There's your answer right there. He, he doesn't want to commit to the club. He wants to go out there and challenge, put himself on the market. And most probably, whether it's... I don't think it's money because the money's good. He's not getting nothing. He's getting really good money. I'm thinking he sees himself that he could do or get something better for his career uh, at another club so that he could maybe play finals football. And every person every player that plays the game is always the goal is to play in grand finals is to try and be you know play 300 games win a grand final being a team that's going to make you and get you there he obviously has not seen that at the Tigers I think he's been great since all this conversation has come out about him I think he's put his hand up 
consistently the last few weeks. He's a big body. He's a strong carrier of the ball. And again, if I think they're going to lose him, and I think the the Tigers are pretty much pretty much know that they're going to lose him. So putting themselves out there to try and find someone to replace him. Yeah, it's interesting that his form's picked up the last month or so. Mm-hmm. You know, at this time, and I think his agent is trying to do the best by him as far as trying to get the best deal. But interesting also was uh, the Tigers' chief exec coming out and saying that he's got no indication that Stefano wants to leave. <laughs> but the fact that he wants to talk and look elsewhere, I think that's indication yeah. enough. That's indication that he wants he wants out, regardless of the offer that you've tabled. And I think he will find more money. Regardless, I think the, any club would love to have a top-line front row, which he's becoming, and he'll be a top-line front row for a while because of his age. He's only 23, I think, so he's got a lot of years ahead of him. And he's a wonderful kid. He's mm. a great kid, Stefano, and wonderful to coach. So he'll be an asset to whatever club gets him. But I, I think he wants out, and I understand his time at the Tigers has been nothing but frustrating. Mm-hmm. And being down, they're back at the bottom of the table again, regardless of the wins the last couple of weeks up until Sunday. Still, it's got to be hard. It's got to be hard, especially on the weekends game when they're standing by the post all day. You know, the, you want to want to go away and experience winning. You want to experience what Blairy's saying, playing in finals, playing in grand finals, experience playing with other great players and achieving a career what's going to take you somewhere to 300 games, but successful with it. You know, so um, I think the kid deserves it. I think he deserves to have that type of career and hopefully his agent's able to get him sorted and sorted soon. Close close to a million dollars, Willie. I think, you know, if you you set him up against, I know he's young, Adam Fenua Blake, you're paying hustles. Is he worth that money yet? Probably not yet, but has the potential to. And in the market, you, you you pay for what a club wants to pay. That's how much you get. That's sure. how much you're worth. Eh? That's right. So if you're in the, you're in the in the front rowers competition, there are not too many quality front rowers or f- top grade first first front rowers. And he's mostly like you said. We said he's on the rise. So you, you pay what you're worth, and people are going to give him money because there's a shortage of good quality front rows and young ones coming through. So, yeah, it's 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 big money, but c- what comes with the big money is the pressure. For sure. So he's been in a lot of pressure here at, at the Tigers because they haven't been performing, but you go to a big club, you go to a big mm. club, there comes more pressure as a young front rower on all this money, then that's when, that's when obviously the pressure comes for a kid of his age. If he's to have the options, let's say, between these two front runners, the Dragons and the Raiders, where would you guys like to see him go out of those two teams? Oh, well, I think he'll fit into the Raiders system really good. I think, um, you know, we talk, you just spoke about Josh Papali. Is he going to go around? They're letting Nick Kotrick go. Jordan Rapana might be not there. We don't know what's going on there. We both said they're building for something. They've got some good young um, outside backs coming through their grades. You add someone like him on the rise, could be a, a great signing for the Raiders. I like it. Yeah, I think there's room for at both clubs. You know, the Dragons are playing Matt DeBellin at the, in the front row mm-hmm. at the moment, and he's not really a front row as such, but doing a good job, doing a good, a good job as an agile middle there. He'll give them a bit of punch if he goes there, but yeah, I think the Raiders are a real good fit for him. A, a young side on the up with a, you know, both sides have experienced coaches, but I think Ricky could really fire him up every week and want to get the best out of him. So I think, yeah, the Raiders are probably the good fit for me. Yeah, even someone like Joseph Tarpany around him, international quality, one of the, the top Elite. players in the comp, um, he could help someone like Stefano just, you know, help and guide him on his journey as well. And I think there's some enough good people around there, like you said, Ricky Stewart, to help him Do you think that's- excel. Do you think that's something that he needs right now is like some experienced front rows or some experienced people around him to kind of get him to another level? Oh, I think he's got to be happy. I think he's got to be happy and confident in his ability that he can deliver consistently. But it also helps when you've got people that believe in you, that can help you, that have done something in the game. Ricky Stewart has been around for a long time, can add so much value to a young guy's confidence and ability. And then you have good players around him. It also helps as well. So I think... I just think the, the, the Raiders is a, a good fit having Ricky and some good leaders around him. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Mm. 
I think it's important that he is surrounded by some people that he can learn off every single day. Yep. Plus, uh, reunite with Seb Chris after their game a couple of weeks ago when he pulled his head. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> good mates. That was good mates. Uh, next up, uh, news on Tom Trevojevic. He's coming back next week. And he's coming back at centre instead of fullback. Ooh. Confirmed from Anthony Siebold. Uh, he said, Turbo and myself have had conversations around what we can do to help him. So presumably there's, they're talking less injury risk or something like that. And uh, Cola is going to move to fullback. Uh, Turbo slot in and Hopwad is going to go back down to reserves, I think, is the plan for them. I thought Willie confirmed that on this show. Yeah, uh, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that another tick for our show? Is, is you, con- <laughs> yeah, you confirmed that, didn't you, Willie? Yeah, well, I, I just I think for his future going forward, <laughs> chuck him in the centres. But no, I thought Hopwadi yeah. would be the fullback. I thought he's been very, very good, Leo Hopwadi. But uh, it looks like he's going to be the one to make way and put Kohler to fullback. But for Tom Trevojevic and the amount of injuries he's had, mm. it's much better for him, less pressure acceleration and running wise and less pressure on his body so he can get the most out. He's such an important cog to their wheel and an important part of our game. And we need him. He's every time he's played representative mm. level, he's played centre. So why not do it at club level too? Mm. Yeah, no one wants to see him on the sidelines and I think, you know, we've spoke about him so many times on here about, you know, shifting in there, less running, you know, getting a little bit older with his legs, obviously having all these injuries with hamstrings and not going to necessarily reach those high speeds that he will have to reach consistently in a game, but having them out there is still a presence to the team and uh, his leadership, but the quality that he has and what happens around him can not only help people around him, but help himself uh, and and be that X factor on, on an edge. I think um, it's a well-needed uh, rest from the come into centre. I think he can still do a job there. He can still be busy with the ball. He's just not running the amount of Ks that he would normally do as fullback. Yeah, I'm interested too. As a side note to this, him and his brother Ben together on the same mm. edge. Mm. Oh, good. The two Draboyevich mm. together on, on that left edge. It'll be very inter- interesting to see how they go. Yeah, sweet. Um, last last bit of news here is the Wayne Bennett and Trent Robinson's uh, quotes on the Sinbin crisis. Yeah. Is also, that there's kind of what they're saying. Basically, they've just come out, both of them, in the media uh, and – complained about the consistency of mm. refereeing that's occurred with stuff like uh, head knock sin bins. Some get, you get one of those and it's a sin bin and then you get a guy shoulder charged yeah. in the head and it's not. Wayne Bennett is just <laughs> sick and tired of it basically. Uh, what do you guys think? Is there a sin bin crisis of sorts? Well, there's no two better people in the game to be speaking about something and, and, and trying to come out and comment about these things. Wayne Bennett's done everything in the game. I think Trent Robinson's high up there in the NRL as well when it comes to decision-making around how the game goes and which way the direction it goes. Um, yeah, I, I, the, for me, it's the inconsistency. Like you said, I think you know some games are different to others, um, and that's where, I guess, teams are getting, or coaches are getting frustrated because... It's taken away what we want to see, the 13 on 13, for example, obviously the origin game. Um, yes, that what that should be a, a send-off. Yes, I get that. But these games through the NRL is when teams are playing against 11 players, it just ruins the game of rugby league because there's no way a team with 13 could lose to a team with 11. It puts pressure on players. Then the game speeds right up and these guys are at no chance in, in winning a game. I just think... The inconsistency is what they're blowing up about, but it's really hard for a team to win a game with that, that amount of players on the field With when you come up against the quality of sides. Like if you've seen the Roosters-Tigers game, 11 players on the field, Roosters are way too good to be just not scoring points, and they took advantage of it, and it's too hard. They just can't, You can't defend, you can't play the game properly. Yeah, I think one, one thing they do want is, or don't want, is games decided by the by someone being simbined, by a team being short. And they don't want a referee's decision to ultimately be the factor that decides the result in the game. Nor do fans want a spectacle like that. Mm. Now, we want a, want a challenge, we want a competition where there's 13 on 13. And if a team runs away with a scoreline at 13 on 13, then so be it. 
but not when there's a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things these two great minds are talking about are things that are either deliberate or dangerous. Mm-hmm. And the dangerous one, we'd go back to the state of origin, and Swali'i, it was dangerous. You know, that deserved to be um, red carded and, and uh, sent off. Deliberate, holding down the professional fouls, yeah, yeah, that's poor. Get off. But some of them, like some of these head eyes, the swinging arms that just go, and um, Adam Dewey had a bit of a hip drop on the weekend, but he, he slipped and got himself in the wrong position. We can leave him on the field, put it on report, and we'll check it on Monday morning or whenever. Do you know what I mean? We still keep everybody on the field. I get it, player safety is important. It's paramount to everything. But not to the extent where... The game, I think there's been 71 yeah, um, sim biddings this year and some of the results have mm. have been resi- have been decided because of those sim biddings. I'll go back to last week, the Tigers against the Raiders. The Raiders' scoreline really flattened them. They didn't win the game, but they scored their tries at the back end of the game when the Tigers went down to 12 and men. They didn't even look likely of scoring It didn't look point. like it. You know, and that's could have been the game. That could have been the result had it been earlier in the game. So, yeah, I, I agree with these two. It's something we've got to address and, and tackle because it, it, it's getting a little bit out of hand. You know what I think too, Willie, is, um, you know, the whole thing, oh, this is, and I'm just going to relate to the state of origin, oh, it's origin, those things get let go. I think that's where it becomes a bit of a grey area as well as because in the NRL, what they do in origin is a penalty or a send-off, but then they let things go in origin that they go, oh, yeah, no, it's origin. That's just what happens in origin. But this is where it becomes a bit of a debate and the inconsistency and guys are going, well, yeah, I get it, it's origin, but if we have consistency in NRL, it shouldn't change the game when you get to NRL level. I know this is the biggest game on their calendar. I know this makes the most money for them. The viewers are all in there. But when we talk about grey areas and consistency and big games, what so because from round 1 to 26 is just all 27 are just normal NRL games, so when it gets to the, the top eight, it, does the rules change again? Are those are those sin bins? Are those r- yeah. yellow cards? Or because it's finals, you let them go. That's when people go. Well, one week ago that was a yellow card or a red card. This week it's just play on penalty, play on. You know what I mean? Like that's that's where I feel like the game is inconsistent when it comes to these calls because we've made it that way. Origin, we're allowed to do whatever we want. NRL, this is where all the great stuff is happens down here, and then in between there, it's a mixed bag of whatever. Well, Origin is that big spectacle yep. and that big event because of what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, we're letting things go a little bit more and the game's flowing and we're letting the competition go head to head and the players stay on the field and go do the battle. That's what we're talking about wanting in the NRL level. Yeah, so we so, want that. So penalise it, put it on report, let the, the guys let the review it and then they'll, they'll, they'll pull them up later in the week, which they do already. You know what I mean? And then Annesley will come out and talk about why we did this and why we did that. So at the moment, so sometimes they're going, yellow card, Annesley comes out and goes, that shouldn't have been a yellow card. Well, that's why we're saying penalise it, put on report, you guys check it out, keep yeah. everyone on the field, we play the game, we speed it up, we enjoy it, we watch it, we watch the spe- spectacle that it is and have every single player out there so we're competing. Yeah, and this is where we come back to the dangerous and deliberate. If it is a dangerous hip drop and somebody does... yeah really get hurt, then we're going to make a decision of mm. taking that decision out of the referee's hand to send him off or give him that 10 minutes. That's fine. I'm good with that. Because some of the argument for this is, and you know, I've had this as a coach, where someone's been put on report and you as the team that have been hurt against, let me put it that way, and then they get two weeks on Monday, mm. I've... I've got no reward for it. Yeah, you've lost. You know, I've lost a player, but in this game, they're allowed to stay on 13, and I've I've got nothing out of it, but I'm the one that's been the victim in this mm. as far as my team. But if that happens and it is bad enough, it is dangerous or deliberate, then go. Then go. Then I get 10 minutes of reward, and I've got to make the most of it. Yeah. But some of them, like, there was a swinging arm in the Dolphins game you know, just before the Matt DeBellin yeah. try. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was incidental. He didn't mean to do that. That wasn't deliberate. Oh, yeah, he got binned, eh? Yeah, got binned, right. yeah. You know, it's one of those. Hey, on report. Yeah, yeah. You know, slid, made contact with the head, 
we'll deal with it. And if it comes on Monday and he gets three weeks, then so be it. Yeah. But there's always going to be arguments that, oh, you know, he should have been gone and he shouldn't have been gone because this is what we've created. Yeah. So no one's ever going to be happy because if it happens to you as a coach, if it happens to the other coach, they're going to be still arguing the same thing and you come to the press conference and that's going to be the conversation, not the game, it's the incident. So yeah. we want to go away from having the conversations about the incidents and talk about how good the game was. You can't talk about the game if there's 11 players on the field. You finish with 11 players and you've got 13 v 11. It's just, it's you're always going to be under the pump. So yeah. we get away from that, the, the incidents, and let's talk about how good the game was because yeah. we had 13 on 13 and the best team won on the day rather than talking about he shouldn't have been 10 minutes over there, he should have got red carded, that was a that was a hip drop, that wasn't a hip drop. Like That's what it ends up being on a, on a Monday is Annesley's explaining all these little things. It's like, let's just talk about the rug game yeah. of rugby league. And I've got to say this while we're on this, we're not having a crack at the refs at all. You know, we're just having a crack at the, the system at the moment. We've mm. got to have a discussion. So everybody's clear. Mm. You know, we don't, it's hard sometimes because we, it, everything's not black and white, yeah. but we want black and white. Of course. Uh, we'll move on to the games and a game that thankfully the spectacle wasn't ruined by the two yellow cards in it. And that is, of course, Origin Game 2, which my Blues... Got the win, baby. Massive win. 38 to 18 from the Blues. Oh, my God. When I was sat at home watching this game, I was cheering. I was pissing everybody off around because of how loud I was cheering. But, yeah, what a beautiful game. Hey, guys. Yeah, you're excited. What a game, though. Like, everything to play for, I think, New South Wales. And it pretty much, you know, I think had their best team on the field and played that way too. Um, dominated on all stats in that first half. Kicking, running, pressure. You know, on, on the MCG, 90,000. There's no bigger stage for the Origin players to be able to play in front of that many people. But then put in a performance like that from the Blues. Um, you know, Mitch Moses was good. You know, their middle forwards were good. Payne Huss, yep. all the speculation about Payne Huss not dominating in Origin. I mean, obviously, the media in New South Wales... Did this one on purpose, I reckon. <laughs> Just so, you know, and Payne, I think Payne is one of those players that he would, like, he's been through that much drama through his life in general oh, yeah. that I think this would have been burning deep down inside for Payne Huss. And I don't think, I thought the media was smart about it because I was thinking, like, yes, he hasn't most probably dominated, but he's still been a contributor. He's still been tr strong with his performances. Yeah. And then they light a fire under him and he just blows blows it out of the park and puts in a performance that, geez, like any other front row would be proud of. I thought they were quality, but you've got to give credit to uh, the Queenslanders as well. I think they stuck in in their second half. Um, positives, they scored some tries, They and they were good tries as well, but up against it now. Um, it's nice that the game's gone to, to one all. Uh, it's great for rugby league. It's great for the fans. Um, Suncorp Stadium, be sold out, 55 um, New South Wales have to go up there and get a job done um, because I guess it's all even slates now. Everyone goes out there to, to get a job done. It's it's body on the line. It's do or die. It's the best team win. So I don't know. Queensland may have some 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 problems or some opportunities they want to look at, whether they change some people around and, and change their team. But true Queensland spirit, I think they'll stay as... Uh, at the end of the day, they're Queenslanders. That's from Queenslanders. You know, they're that's they're it. Queenslanders. So they'll find someone to get a job done. I think that's what he was trying to say is no matter which way he goes, he will find someone to get a job done. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, they're Queenslanders. <laughs> he being Billy and, and Billy we still trust. <laughs> but yeah, full credit to New South Wales. That first half of football was as close to perfection that I've seen for a long time. Yeah. You know, they... Mm. Queensland could not get out of their own half, let alone get into the New South Wales 20-metre area. The kicking of Moses was outstanding. Luai was superb with yeah. his, how he ran the team around and short kicking game. The guys that came back in, Mitchell Moses, Luttrell, Cam Murray, yeah, he's wonderful. Just you know, the whole pack just dominated Queensland that first half. Anybody that carried the ball from Queensland got absolutely smashed to bits. We couldn't make any metres, kept kicking from inside our own half and couldn't get out. Brian Toto and uh, Dylan Edwards, who came back in, just getting close to halfway every single time. So at half time, 
whilst I didn't want to admit it, the game was gone. Mm. The game was gone, and you don't see that or hear that in Origin ever. So, yeah, the way they came out, put the blitz on Queensland, they deserve the win. They deserve to come out, and it's great that it's at one all. It's exciting. We go back, and then, you know, the competition's still alive. The series is still open, and you know, we everyone will talk about how, how tough it is for New South Wales to go to Queensland. But yeah, Queensland have got a task on their hand. They've got to regroup. They've got to do it without Xavier Coates now, who's mm-hmm. done his hammy. Mm-hmm. He'll be out for Game Three. What reshuffle they make? Some people are questioning Val Holmes. I thought he tried to be aggressive. He was one of the Queenslanders that did try and put it on New South Wales. Came up with some misses. You know, asking, does he miss out? Does he go to wing? Does Dane Gagai, who was 18th man, come in somewhere? Cobbo's there. Cobbo to, could come back in. You know, if he gets himself 100% fit, that Billy wants him. But they've got options. We've got options, and we we've got <laughs> options, and. Yeah, we'll go up there in front of a, a big crowd again at Suncorp and Decider. Yeah, it'll be, be a very, very good game in a couple of weeks' time. You know, um, although I thought the kicking game of Mitch and the way that the game plan that the Blues did, whenever the Queensland team get inside the half and start playing some football, they can score points. So I think the, the confidence in them being able to get down there, that was the hardest thing for the Queensland team is they couldn't get out of their own half. No. They were kicking deep in their own half because of the pressure that New South Wales put on them. So any time they got near the try line, they actually looked really good. Obviously, everyone's talking about Reese Walsh not having too much impact because they couldn't even get out of their own half. So he comes alight when he's, when he's inside the half because he can start playing some football. When they start playing football, they've got a, a good enough team to score points. And you've seen that they scored their points. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought, you know, it, it was a hard, hard game for everyone to be involved. And, like, we're all picking at players that shouldn't be there or people should come in and there's some injuries now. And, and this is what will happen anyway, that someone's going to get injured and someone will just come back into the team. So you got Dan Gagai sitting on the sideline. I think he'd be quality. Cobbo's there as well. So, you know, it's an interesting one for sure because I even think, like, I'm just thinking, like, you know, I know the Blues won. Is, do, do they change anything? Because I just don't know about their bench. I know that Yo comes on, but I think Cameron Murray can play 80, and I thought he was massive. I thought he was massive through the middle of the park with his quick play of the balls, but his toughness as well. Um, Homoli, nothing against Homoli, but where do you play him if he's not playing in the back row? Because Angus Crichton killed it. You know he's the only I mean? one so, if they made a change would be so those, those couple of guys. Because so, I thought Watson yeah. and Spencer's been outstanding yes, yeah, yeah, off yeah. the bench. But I'm just trying to think, like, if yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, to no, have I, more. I, I think to, they go with the same, I To think. go up another gear, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is the final. Do you want to Do you go for another front rower more than anything? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I just... Because you're oh. only rolling Spencer and you on it, aren't you? Is this your way of like pushing? Oh, Mitch, Mitch Barnett. Barnett. Well, I think Mitch yeah. Barnett would get a job done at, at front row. So if you have Spencer and Mitch, Mitch there, then you've got well, Connor. His thing over Homoli is he can play middle and edge. Yeah, but he's oh, he's an edge back row, like yeah. a quality edge back row that can run lines and run over the top of people. But if you're only giving him 20 minutes in an Origin. You might as well get quality out of a front rower. Yeah. You know what I mean? That can come on the back of someone like Spencer Lenu and get a job done. I'm just nitpicking both. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm just thinking, I'm thinking bigger picture, like you're gonna have to go up another gear and everyone's gonna have to have an impact in the game. Um, and I just think Cameron Murray can play 80. I think he's dominant enough to play 80. And then you're just sticking Yo on there just to stick him on there. I, you, you know what I mean? And I think same with Homoli is if he's not a front rower, he's a back rower. Yeah. And then you try and find a couple of front rowers to get a job done. See Mitch Barnett's getting close. He's, he was 18th man. I, I just think he's a he's an out and right, can get a job done in the middle of the park. And you've seen what he did for the Warriors and the aggression that he has to be able to play. Just think carrying another front rower maybe make more sense. I don't know. Well, yeah, I think the front rowers will be important in this game for both teams. Mm. I think Queensland who, as I said, got dominated early doors by the New South Wales defence, tried to alter their game a little bit and pass their way around. Mm. You know, there was a moment there where Fotoeka gets the ball and tries to tip on to Dead and he got smashed by yeah. Mitchell Moses. That's not what they needed. It's not origin. Whereas second half, they rolled their sleeves up, started to power through them, made some metres, got them to those good ball areas. So I think that'll be a lesson that Queensland take out of it. We need some big middles and to combat that, 
That's what New yeah. South Wales will have to have. I think there'll be a big war of attrition through the middle of the field in game three. I don't know if there'll be a lot of football mm. until later stages in the game, but those early exchanges will be a real big battle coming up, and that's yeah what we get excited about. Well, you, you chuck Jake Travoyva, just put a Mitch Barnett on, you take Payne Hussle and put a Spencer Lee New on, and then you have Cameron Murray with the, the speed, his leg speed and his quick play of the balls, being able to create the momentum for the guys like Mitch Mosin and and, and uh, Luai to be able to do his work around the ruck. So I think it makes I think it well, it makes sense to me. Uh, it may not be for Michael Maguire because he's the coach, but I just think... You know, having two front rowers, solid front rowers that can get a job done on the back of Cameron Murray and what he can do for the middle of the park. Like you said, it's going to be through the middle of the park. It's going to be a war. They're going to have to go and bash Queensland and Queensland going to have to do the same thing. They're going to have a, have a different mindset. Once it starts opening up and it starts getting quicker, then you allow Luai to come jump around. Mitch Mojo starts taking on the line, give the ball to Latrell, he does his thing. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they go. But it'll be hard if they leave someone out. I, you know what I mean? Like, they've been there from game one. You know what I mean? He's got his team that he wanted in from the start. They're all injury-free at the moment. And to leave someone out. Yeah. But you've got to think a bigger picture. You've got to win. You've got to win. Like, he's, New South Wales are under the pump because they haven't been able to win before. Uh, so Michael Maguire will have to have a deep think of what the best team is that's going to get a win up in, in Suncorp. Well, speaking of changes, what do you, do you think there'll be, not mass changes, but how many changes do you expect from Queensland after that loss? There might be some outside backs due to some injuries yeah. and stuff like that. I think, um, you know, they might bring Fafita in. They might bring Fafita in. Um, I guess, and if I'm thinking of anyone, it'll be Kafusi. They maybe miss miss out, um, but like we both said, it's going to be a war. So you want your best, toughest defenders on the field, um, because through the middle of the park, that's where it's going to be won early. You win that part, then it allows the guys like Ben Hunt and those guys to play their play their footy. Yeah, an interesting one with. Uh going back to what they had in game one with Cobo on the bench, because mm -hmm. when Hammer went down, it was almost, geez, we need him now. We could have done Kate with well fell into that spot. Yeah, we did, yeah. We could have had a, a back ready to go. That was a perfect change. Whether he does that again in game three, then we've got to wait to be seen. But yeah, Kurt Capewell's got that utility value that we spoke about before the game. That hasn't changed. So yeah, I, I think if somebody comes on, it's someone like Fafita. Someone who's got that punch and that fear of his carry to skittle some defenders and create some havoc around the ruck so they can generate some ruck speed to get through some some tired defenders if he comes off the bench. I think it'd be a, a good one for game three. The only concern with bringing people in, like no one would have been able to change what happened in game two. Um, so if, if they're coming off their own line against someone like Fafita, I don't know if he can carry them out of trouble and, and do what they did because... New South Wales was so dominant. They've got to have a fair share of the ball. I think the, the percentage of the ball was 78% yep. in the first half. Like, there is no way you're going to win any game or win any half against the best players in the world when it comes to rugby league and, and be able to try and come off your trial and try and win a game. Because if you're starved of possession, which is what our game is all about, it doesn't matter who you are, you're not going to be able and not be able to get them out of trouble because we've just seen no. the result. And if there is a downside, that's probably it. With Reese Walsh, yeah, you no, know, carrying out a yard is because he's body. so small, and he got picked up and driven back. Whereas the Dylan Edwards, you know, he's got his footwork and size mm -hmm. to get through, get down, and play the ball quick. You know, a lot of that time, a lot of those times are on the back of Toto, which generates your speed anyway. But yeah, the back three are going to have to be good to start their sets off really well. Yeah, good, good on Dylan Edwards. I like him. Right. I he like did, him. He mate. did. He did. He did. Like, there was times there that, like, they rushed him and he managed to use his feet, poke his nose yeah. through, and I'm thinking, like, he is origin made. Like, what a play he's, he's going to be for New South Wales for the future because, man, he's tough. He's tough. I was going to say, you guys, you guys touched on the war of attrition. Like, that game too, because Queensland gave away so many penalties early and it was, like, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back mm. sets. Is that what eventually led to that that avalanche in that first half. It was just that weighted position. They held up for so long. But in 
against a quality side like that, you need to be able to, you know, fix yeah. that sort of thing. Well, six against sitting on your try line against the best players for their state with the control that they had with Mitch's kicking game, uh, with the way that they ran, with the strike power they have all over the field, like, that built the pressure on, on Queensland that you can't... I think they might have done 14 tackles on their try line. Like, that's... You can't do mm. more than that in, in an origin. You can't even do that in a normal NRL game. But they hung in tight the whole way. And it was just a simple short ball of Liam Martin. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's simple, but everyone has to run the right lines and you have to make your tackle. But you only have to be off a split, you know, turn a split to, to the side and someone runs as hard as he does, scores a nice try and... You know that that's what that's that's pressure. That's that's fatigue. Yeah. That's you know what I mean. It's, that's communication under fatigue. So all those little things and the build up of penalty into six against. That's what they end up getting. But they worked hard. The New South Wales boys have just been nice and hard and direct with their runs and then on the back of the kicking game. Yeah, discipline was poor too. Yeah, I think it was six penalties to zero. Yeah, that was it from Ashley Klein and you know, that. When you're, when you're defending, like Blair is saying, time after time, set after set, the halfbacks in the opposition, they're rubbing their hands together because they get to run and dictate play yeah. on their own terms because you can't get any pressure on the inside, mm. can't get any line speed. So Mitchell Moses is able to pick the defenders and find the holes that he's scheming for, for Liam Martin to go through. And their edges with Crichton and Luttrell, they're dangerous anyway, let alone being on the front foot. Yeah. And... That try that uh, um, that Stephen Crichton set up for Zach mm. Lomax, they've spread the ball out wide. He's beating defenders just too strong. It was flimsy defence from Queensland, but it was fatigue. It was tired yeah. defence because of all the pressure that they were put under. Yeah. They've got to try and think about, and this will be a big big part of their uh, camp when they go in, is trying to turn that tide, stop that from happening in the first place. Yeah. Do you know what their match fee was? They what? Their match fee, because I've seen they got charged. Some oh, yeah, of the boys got charged in seven percent. Yeah, seven percent of their match fee. That's that's more than a. Is that's more than an NRL game, isn't Ooh. it? Seven percent of your match fee. You Wait, take what's the, this? You take the, the, you'll the take that. You'll take that. That's the fine. Yeah. So in the the origin, when you get charged or you get a grading, they it's yeah. a seven percent of your your fee that you earn from origin. I think that's more than your NRL stuff. It must be. I'll take Dugan the thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll give me the thousand bucks. You're going to it's up to six guys. digits, or not that high for? Well, I think I, oh, I don't know. I think for what, just the what, match what's, fee. I think the match fee. I think a while back when I was playing was like nearly fifty. Fifty, 50 yeah. That's was nearly fifty k. Yeah. That's so, what I thought it was. So I don't know if it's gone down since then. Um, I know that obviously you get taxed that, and then half goes into your your pension. pension and then you get half, you know what I mean? And then, so you may end up with, which is still a lot of money, you still end up with a good amount of money. According yeah. to the Sydney Morning Herald, men's state of origin 30. players earned 30K per yeah. match in yeah. 2023. Yeah. So During the pandemic, they received 10K and 15K, so less. So, so is, it tax, is it the 7% on the 30 or the 7% on the what's left? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, seven percent is a lot of money when it comes to those. But again, yeah, you do the Keep crime. Keep your nose clean. Yeah, yeah, you do the crime. You have to pay. All right, we'll we'll move on. We'll move well, on to before, some. One more thing though, Reese Walsh. Like when you watched him play in that game, did he seem a little bit off the pace to you guys? Because there's been some chat about potentially having Hammer back there in his place until he can actually get. Because he hasn't played many matches. You know, he comes. Been sitting on the yeah. sideline, then he has to go straight in there. He just looked a little bit, a little bit sluggish, right? Yeah, well, with the with the way the game went, he's like, yeah, he he, he did look sluggish with the way the game went. They had no ball, all the pressure against them. But um, even his positioning on kicks. And stuff yeah, like yeah, that. that first try, yeah, oh, yeah. that try that Mitch Moses, like, yeah, you'd love to see your fullback move quicker than what he did, yeah. um, because if you're watching, which I think he sets himself up for Mitch. Yeah. If Mitch Mitch moves, you move too, because I think Lou I was tackled. Yeah. He was tackled off the yeah. ball, so you would love to see your fullback move a lot quicker than that. Um, at the same time, there's rules, uh, I guess, there's systems that 
teams play with, put your foot up and stop the ball. But at the same time, you just love to see your fullback in, in a position to be able There's to no try, and, try and say that. But he was 25 metres off yeah. where he should have been. So, yeah, fatigue again, like we said, most probably haven't got any match fitness. Hopefully he gets a couple of games in because he obviously missed the Warriors game. So a couple of games in again and then be better for it, definitely. He looked lively to start the game. Mm. A couple of plays down the short yep. side, he tried to yep. take him on and, and come up with a good play to Murray Talangi to make a yep. break. So he was there to start with, and probably symptomatic of how the team was. You know, they started to crack under the pressure, which which isn't a good sign. Yeah, I think what you're talking about, if you take Hammer, who's got a bit of a shoulder niggle, and put him at the back, it takes him out of the firing line. Mm. I wouldn't be against doing some of that. He's got that run thread as well, plays fullback every week, but yeah, that's another decision for Billy Slater to make. Man, that guy that uh, always complains that we talk too much about Origin isn't going to be happy, <laughs> but that's all right, mate. Origin's fun. You just don't understand yet. Uh, and speaking of Origin, I mean, let's just keep talking about it because the women's state of Origin decider did happen and not as good news for the Blues because yeah. the Maroons actually won it. Despite... Blues dominating game one and two. It wasn't the case in game three, and they couldn't get it done. Yeah, it definitely wasn't the case. Um, and I watched all three games, and they obviously played their best game in their third game. Man, they were dominant in the first half. Everything they did was strong. Um, Politi was good at wide. Like, she was involved in everything. The two front rowers, they were solid for Queensland. They just ran with momentum, ran hard, ran tough. They needed to. Obviously, it was a big game for both teams, but I just saw the... The Queensland girls just looked more hungry, more desperate in everything and had more intense in what they did. Um, again, we've spoken about how good the uh, New South Wales women's team is and the athletes that they have on there and what they can do and what they have been able to do. Um, should have taken the game away from Queensland in game two, didn't yeah. put themselves in this position to go to a, a decider, which is great for the game uh, because everyone's been asking for, they've been asking for three games, they got it. You know, a sold-out stadium. The conditions, yes, they were used to it because I think they played the round one, the first game in wet conditions. This one was wet. It would have been muggy up in Townsville. But Queensland just worked hard. They ran hard. They were good. They were solid. Um, they were precise as what they did and, and scored more tries and obviously won the game. Yeah, congrats to Queensland. Congrats to Townsville for putting it on and turning out the numbers. Yeah, it looked like uh, they were still a little bit hurt and some scarring from that late loss in Newcastle for the New South Wales team. They, they looked a bit uh, gun-shy to start the game. <coughs> Excuse me. And Queensland just pounced on it. And the forwards were outstanding, mm. punching through the middle. It was all Queensland and New South Wales couldn't score till late on until Chapman got that runaway try. And, you know, she's a brilliant athlete. Just, that's her second. It was... Uh, it was like the first try she scored in, in yeah. game one. Yeah. And she's a big, strong thing, but can run, she can motor. But Queensland, I thought Ellie Brigginshaw being back in the halves rather than at 13 was a big change for them yeah. to winning this. She got her hands on the ball a bit more, directing play, setting up tries. That's her go. She, she looked a bit off the pace at 13, but she's able to direct the game and take control of it, which Queensland needed her to. So, yeah, good win. 2-1, been a great series. Been mm. a, yeah. If you look back on it and you grade it, New South Wales were the better team. Yeah. The first two games, Queensland snuck away with it. But ultimately, it's three games. They got it done, won the series 2-1. So first game, first series of three games, well done, Queensland. And well done to all of them. They've put on a show. They've really uh, shown how far they've come in the women's game. And they deserve the three-game series from here on in. We'll lead straight into the NRW soon. Like, they're not far off. I'm, good. I'm sure the women outside watching Origin are getting itchy feet and wanting this NRW season to kick off real soon. So it's a great lead-up to, to where they're going. Um, you know, it's exciting times for the, the game, the women's game, that's for sure. <clears throat> Last one before we move off of it. Um, Shannon Martel, yep, one beast. player of the series. Man, she is a gun forward. She topped the metres, had 151 metres in Game 3. Bro, she looks unstoppable. I reckon she might be up there as one of the best players in the whole NRLW. Yeah, well, I think between the the, the two front rowers and their lock, I thought they were they were quality. That, that's what started it for for 
the Queensland team, uh, and we've spoken about the men's and where it's going to go through the game. It starts in the middle of the field. If you can build that momentum, it allows the guys out wide to score the points. So similar to the men's, the women would had to do the same thing. Yeah. They muscled up. They would have t- taken on this challenge of this is it's us versus them, and it's my position versus the other front row, and we've got to go at it. And, and made the best team win, and that's what she did. She she carried strong. She was strong defensively. Covered a few tackles there when they poked their nose through. So. Massive ups to like her and the Queensland forwards for doing what they did to try and dominate a, a quality, and I think quality New South Wales women's team. Just a, a question. If the NRLW has started before the series began, does yeah. the series even better? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, without be. a doubt. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They sort of come into this cold well, and they still yeah, deliver that. They play the local stuff first. Well, not the local stuff. They Obviously, their tournament outside yeah. before the NRL stuff, like the club stuff. And it's most probably, I guess the quality is getting better, but you go from that and then the quality comes right up to the roof. So if you've already started the NRLW, you're already getting that taste of the quality. Yeah. If we have a start early, mid-season break for the women, three weeks, that quality goes right up through the roof. Yeah, and that's then what and I think too. Everything else just moves on the back of that. You get a rest, go again. So do, you think, do you think they should sync up the origin instead of the finals? Because I know they they've done the women's season so that the finals is at the same time as the NRL's like final start? Yeah, well, you just start a little bit earlier so it still syncs up. You know what I mean? You just start the NRLW season a bit early, but then it most probably won't tie into like the Tasha Gale and all those kind of yeah. other tournaments. I reckon oh, even if it is two or three weeks yeah. of NRLW three weeks would be good. to lead into this where the girls are sort of battle-hardened. Yeah, because you need, it takes about three weeks or four weeks just to get that repetition back under your legs yeah. and moving, getting into that game fitness because yeah. you can do all the presses and you like, but it's, there's nothing like an actual game fitness where you're up, down, yeah. contact, getting to the, you know, doing all those kind of things. So three weeks, boom, in the middle, jam it out and then go yeah. again. What does Scary. That mean, awesome. What does that mean in terms of the quality of the, like for the club teams, because they're probably going to have to rest players. Do you think they're actually going to have enough numbers to be able to support that? Because obviously you're going to have juniors and people like that having to take the places of all these stars. Yeah. Well, I guess. Or do you actually just pause the whole thing for a couple of weeks? Well, I guess the same as like uh, NRL, like when someone's injured, it gives another opportunity. So I think you're just creating more opportunities for younger women to get into the. They may be behind some of these guys that are sitting there. So if I'm guessing they all have about 30, 30 people, 30 women in their, in their spots, but, but more than that. So I think, I think it works. I just think it'll be such a higher quality game, although it was already pretty good and the execution was pretty mean for the whole three series, uh, yeah. three, um, three games. I think, man, it could even be better. Do you I think there's actually a talent pool there, though, in the women's game for, for the NRLW to still have quality players? Like, is that good for Well, you're, you're, you're digging yeah, right so down. I don't yeah, know what I mean. Saying, like, come no, on, I've seen before. Yeah, well, I, I think a little bit what Ephraim's saying is if you want to line up the back end of the season with the NRL grand final, mm. then you've got to have a pause. You've got to have a break in the competition. Mm. But you resume when the Origin's finished again, you come back to it. So you're not having to rely on some of those younger ones or anybody that isn't up to the quality, but what you are doing is you're enhancing the origin period Yeah. because you're preparing the players better. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're getting off to the start because if that's the case, and this can get even better than what it is, it's quite scary where it could get to. Yeah. But we're, they're already talking about in the NRL space stopping the game so that the, the origin can just play by itself, like standalone weekends, eh? Because what's happening is all these gun players are all playing origin. You're getting and this is no disrespect for these rookies coming through, they're getting the opportunities to play, but fans go to the game to watch the best players play and pay all this money for them. So if we were to just stop it, bring all the eyes in here, the girls will be on at the same time, the men are on at the same time, all the eyes come straight in because they're watching the best players, there's no other league mm. going on, bam, all here, you're producing more money, the spectacle's bigger, yeah. the game's bigger, because there's nothing else going on. So all the eyes are tuning straight in because everyone's going, where's rugby league, where's rugby league? Well, there's origin right in the middle of your face. And then here you go. So if they're going to stop the the NRL for the, the men's, then line it up like we've said, put the women's in there as well and just becomes this great game of rugby league again. Wow. <laughs> 
Uh, wow. Well, you heard that NRLW execs, you know, listen up to these two. These we three, know what these we're talking about over here, bro. They've Far got the plan. Out. You hit them up. They'll give you like a full write-up Yo. Uh, and all that stuff. <laughs> Moving on to NRL games. Oh. First we one. got the, oh, yeah. we got the, jeez. It has taken a while. You but. just wanted to talk about the origin stuff. <laughs> First one of the week was the Bulldogs versus the Sharks, and what a game, 15-14 to the Bulldogs. Yeah. What a kick to win the game. Man, and Did, what a miss from Nico Hines. Yeah. Well, well, there was a few opportunities in there to win the games for both teams, even in the Golden Point stuff as well. Um, you know, obviously Bulldogs are sitting, I think, second best defensive team in the comp, and it pretty much shows with the scoreline of how they how they've been defending really good together. Um, <coughs> our little mate at the hooker there is playing up as always, oh. um, <laughs> which which Reed. which who is I think is their key player around the middle of the park. Um, they play a lot of um, stuff off the nine, and he plays a lot to their big middles. But they're no frills players through the middle of the park. They just get the job done. But defensively work hard together. Their strikers out wide, kick out. Obviously, Crichton on the other side, and and Burton with the way he can control a game. So, I mean, it was a. I thought you know to start the game off, they did really well. I think they took it away from the Sharks. A credit to the Sharks. I thought Britton Nakora, who's been really good, uh, Brit over a long time. The way that he runs those lines are tough. He brings them back into the game, but again, credit to the Dogs defensively um, have shifted their minds. That they've been putting in these performances consistently this season, um, and they've been able to perform at the, the, the highest level consistently every week. Second best defensive team in the comp. It's got to be, uh, you know, credit not only to the coaching staff, but for everything that they've done over the time that the coach serrato has been there and the boys, you know, putting it all into play. Yeah, they were exciting. A really good game to watch. You know, especially when uh, Nakora scored to bring him back into it because it looked like uh, the dogs were going to run away with it. It wasn't the best mm. start for them, but they get a bit lucky when Kikau grubbers the ball, three picks it up and scores, and then Reed Marnie gets out of dummy half. To extend the lead, Cronulla needed that try from Nakora mm. just to get him back in the game, and the momentum swung after half time when uh, Katoa got dragged over the line. I thought Mulitalo was outstanding when he was held up and then just drops the ball yeah. to his foot Great try. to set up a try for Trindle to give him the lead. And the game was in the balance, only two points. And then when the Dogs kicked the penalty, it became that drop kickathon. Feels so much for uh, Nico Hines. Uh, I, I thought Reed Marty <laughs> rattled oh. him. He got into his head. The thing you've got to like about Reed Marty, he goes after anyone. He went yeah. after Saifidi, he's gone yeah. after Nick, Nico Hines in this one. He's just the ultimate pest to. You know, his team. When you have someone in your team like that, geez, you love him. I think he's he going to get donked soon, eh? I think someone's going to I think someone's gonna whack him soon. It's coming. Uh, he's going to pick on yeah. the wrong person and someone's just going to go whack. Um, yeah. yeah but Cor like, Corey Horsburgh. Oh, <laughs> lucky awesome. Corey Horsburgh's not playing. <laughs> but he is he is a menace. Yeah. And, but he says that he does whatever it takes for the team. He's not going to back down, and he's been a big part of their transition. No, like I said, like, if he's on your side or you're coaching him, you love him. Yeah. He's not giving away a penalty. He's winning you stuff. But then Burton, he had three attempts, I think two, one from 45, one from 47. And then he he kicks one from 37 off the right. ricochets off the upright to get him the win. His kicking game, his kicks... Oh, are these. ridiculous. And how how nice does he hit those droppies? That one just before the end of the game, I was like, this guy's going to hit it from that yeah. far out and just misses it, just goes right at the post. But I'm like, like someone go and block him down because yeah, he's yeah. going to kick it. He's got a big boot on him. Yeah, Nico Hines missing that one, open the door for him. But yeah, well done to the dogs. They're climbing up. Mm. The, the Sharks still t stay third, which is a surprise um, that they're that high up after their form the last couple of weeks. I think they've lost four out of five. Yeah. You know, after after you know, their start to the season, that winning run of about six or seven games that they went on, they're fortunate to have backed those games, but they've got to find a win very, very soon. Well, that's the important thing here in this competition, bro, is those first 10, 11 rounds, you need to try and get as many wins as you can because as teams build consistency, as injuries come in, this is you could still be sitting at the top of the table. And like you said, four out of their last five wins or five games, they haven't won. And still sitting in the top top four, you know what I mean. So, this is the whole thing around you know just building your game early in the season on just positioning completion, 
and then banking those wins no matter how you get them because at some stage you're going to get all these injuries, other teams are going to get consistency, they're going to have all their players on it, on the field at once yep. and um, you still manage to be able to sit in there. So credit to those guys still hanging in there but, geez, they we put on some pressure. We'll move along but, man. Well, what's, what's happening with the Sharkies? Like, what's actually going wrong with that team at the moment? In well, your opinion. I, I don't is think it, is it Nico because Nico doesn't seem to be playing that well at the moment as well. How much of that is the origin confidence? Yeah, well, that's the same thing that they could have said. They said last year, eh, on the back of him yeah. getting left out of the origin side, um, things kind of went downhill before it went up again. And I kind of feel like it's the same things happening again. I think he plays a big part in what the the Sharks do. His confidence in the way that he plays helps everyone else around him. They've got strike strike players all through the, through their through their team but i think nico is a massive contributor to what they do so when he's lacking confidence then his ability is compromised yeah. because i'm guessing he's second guessing himself he may not think it while he's playing but subconsciously when things aren't going your way you're trying to create things that you don't normally create and He's good enough to be able to put these guys in better positions and they should be winning these games. They've got so much strike and you've seen some of the nice tries that obviously Britain scored. Like These are the things that they can do. They're, they're quality all over the park. So I think it's a it's a lack of confidence yep. for him who become, who's a big part of what Cronulla do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll go back to the, I think it was the Raiders game where he almost single-handedly won the game mm. for the Sharks because of his running game. He's got to get that, get belief back in that, get his hands on the ball more, take on defences, create some speed. Because Trindle's trying to do his bit. I just mm. feel like he's trying to get himself involved in the game. But, yeah, confidence is crazy sometimes and he just seems to be down on mm. on that department a touch. And if he can get himself going, because I thought Seth Italikai was, yep. was good for them, trying to get him to go forward and give him a platform to play off. Mm. He wasn't taking advantage of that enough. Mm. And then on top of that, the drop goal he misses, you know, that'll be haunting him. But interested to read uh, Craig Fitzgibbon's comments after the game, and I, I believe it somewhat. If he can see it in the right way, he'll take a lot of growth and grow from that, missing that kick. Yeah. You know, and the, the adversity and the pressure that comes with it. And I think he'll turn a season around, and just fortunate that what Blair is saying, they've banked enough games to win, they'll find a second run of form mm. going to the back end of the season and I'm sure he'll be a big part of it. Mm. Well, I got one for you. Just that you made me think the the four and five uh, losses for the Sharks, I think all or maybe four of those games have been since Braden Trindle has returned. Yeah, I was thinking that. C- could maybe they go back to Daniel Atkinson as the six? I mean, they were winning even without Nico against the Storm, for example when they had Daniel Atkinson at the helm of the team. Mm. Could he be the keys to like getting the, turning them back around? Bringing back Trindle didn't work as well. No, possible, possible. But if Trindle's playing better than Nico at the moment, well, I don't think they'll ever look at dropping yeah. Nico <laughs> at all. So it's a tough one. You know, do they put him on the bench and try and bring him on? Um, that's something I did think about, whether they bring Atkinson back, because he was brilliant when he played and he was winning. Yeah, he's just got to back his ability to go and just go back to just doing what he does really well. I think it's, you know, we play it, they play a tough game of rugby league. Like, there's no, no doubting what they do on the field. And the pressure that comes with being a professional athlete or a rugby league player is, is crazy. So, like, he's good enough. And like you said, really, they'll, they'll, go, they'll go down here, but they'll come back up at some time and they'll be competing at the back end of the season. Next game up, Warriors versus Broncos at Go Media, of course. 32-16 to the Warriors. Happy about that one. Tamari and uh, Chanel doing their bit there. They yeah. had three tries between the two of them. Well, they needed to. Um, I know all the fans will love this. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I'll tell you what, like what happens and what I've realised now being on the outside is that it actually makes everyone's weekend. Um, you know, everywhere <laughs> I go in the community, like everyone, all they want to do is talk about the Warriors, win or lose. But when they win, you see the smile on everyone's face and they just love talking about the Warriors. So all our Warriors fans out there would love seeing the Warriors winning um, because, you know, everyone's so passionate about it. Whether they win or lose, 
there's going to be guys that are going to bag the shit out of players and there's going to be guys that are just ride the highs and lows with everyone. You know what I mean? The OGs that are still there. Um, but they needed to bounce back big. Um, they weren't, you know, for me, they weren't going to put in another performance like they did against the, the Titans. There's not too many times you see in any club or any player, you back up the performance of the week before because... Mate, they were, let's get it straight, they were poor the weekend before against the Titans and they had to come out here and, and make a statement. Um, the Broncos were under strength to the max and they had left their origin players behind. They've got a very young group of young men out there trying to do a job. But at the same time, you can only play with what's on the field. So the Warriors did a good enough job there. I thought they were they were good between those two halves. Again, now Sean Johnson sitting on the sidelines with that Achilles a problem. I think these guys are, are the future of moving forward for the club. Um, they they play a great brand of rugby league. Um, they they play eyes up, which is great, and the, you can relate these two boys to someone like Sam Walker. Uh, very young in their careers, but I think Tamati's done some 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 played played so many games, played at international level. Um, so is you know Chanel. So they're quality young men that know how to play rugby league. But I do like the way that they carry themselves on the field, uh, just play what they see, take the ball really close to the line. But I think everything was helpful those two half with Dylan Walker through the middle of the park. I think he's been the big difference with the speed that he plays at. Obviously, no one was good last week, but the speed that he takes the ball to the line with obviously opens up the space for those guys outside. But they still have to do a bit of work. Adam Fanua Black was massive. Um, again, he wasn't going to put on a performance from the week before and he had to come out there and make a statement. Everyone's always questioning whether he's in or out. Um, and there's moments where you think that he's out, but then you see the performance that he puts in here. Obviously, having Mitch Barnett back's a big key to what the Warriors need. Um, aggression, leader, you know, there's no second guessing what he brings to the club and the boys love playing alongside him and a great move of you know, putting Jackson Ford on the bench and getting that reaction that the Warriors needed for the middle of the park with Adam Fanua Black, I thought they were dominant. Yeah, well, first I'll start off with uh, congratulating the fans for coming out in force. Mm. You know, it would have been easy for people to stay away on the back of last week's loss to the Gold Coast. But such is their adoration for the team and their want to support the team and turn the fortunes around. They just came out in force and... Uh, I was so happy that they got the win and mm. the team returned the favour for them turning out in their numbers. But yeah, full credit to the guys for doing that. There would have been some demons from last week and they had to push those aside and get themselves focused on, on the Broncos side, regardless of who they played. I did find it really crazy that Kevin Walters decided to rest his origin mm. players, given the predicament they're in. Mm. They're, they're in a position where they need yep. to start winning games and there's some pressure yep. on them to start collecting some wins. So big gamble, big gamble that didn't pay off for him to rest his, his big guns and there was a few of them. But yeah, the Warriors took full advantage. The halfbacks, again, outstanding. I was really impressed with how they clicked together. And then to Mighty, and yeah, he's young. Both of them are quite young. And you see Tamaiti is young, but he's been around for a little while. Mm. He's been around, I think he's been playing first grade since 2016, 15 maybe. He, he was also a key instrument to when the Cowboys made their grand final, yep. when they lost, when Jonathan Thurston was injured. A lot of credit goes to Michael Morgan for directing them, but Tamaiti played a big part in that. So he's got some experience and he's he knows what it takes at that level. And he's come back to the game and really kicked on. And when, when asked to be the leader, he's done that really well and set up Chanel for his try, took one, set up a couple of tries with kicks. He, uh, he looked really confident out there playing eyes up football, playing what, he's, what he sees. But yeah, I thought Dylan Walker, his leg speed made a real difference. He just carried the ball, played it quick, had the Broncos defence on the back foot. And they, they bounced back into it and they were never out of the game, the Broncos. But the Warriors, to their credit, they stuck to it. And in the context of everything, to bounce back and get a, not only a good performance, but a win on the back of that debacle that was the Gold Coast Titans. Uh, full credit to everyone involved in the club for turning it around, especially the coach. 
There's also old boys weekend too, Willie. You out Whoa. there? Yo. You out there? I've seen all the old boys out there. It was great to see some of those um, legends, uh, all legends of of the game, and especially for the Warriors. A lot of kids most probably don't remember half the people, but some of the faces that they do remember. That would have been good to see you guys all there. Also, the jerseys representing, you know, the first time the Warriors yep. played them, 1995, was it? 95, yeah. Like, that was pretty yeah. cool to see too. Yeah, first game first game the Warriors played in 95 was the Broncos game. Yep. So it was a nice way to, to celebrate that. And it was nice to catch up with all the old boys, all our old teammates, and to be led out again by Warrior number one, our old captain, mm. Dean Bell. Kiwi legend, Warriors legend. First one ever. Good, good weekend? It was a good weekend. Was a, <laughs> yeah, it was a, <laughs> Yeah, Saturday night was a bit better than Sunday morning. So. <laughs> a few, still, still a few OGs that just go hard. Yeah, this, yeah, go back to being eighteen again. Yeah. We've had a couple, but yeah, go back to what you were saying. Really, really interesting. And going out on Sunday mornings for a walk, and more so this weekend yeah. than last weekend. I saw a few more jerseys at the cafes. Yeah, yeah. A few more Warriors fans were out in force. Not too many last week, but they're yeah. out there again. I've got a few, Stay on the bandwagon. Got a few touch mates I pay off on Sunday and they, they can, uh, bro, can you have a word to the coach about not playing this guy? And I'm <laughs> yeah. thinking, my bro, i got no pull on what happens <laughs> around there because like, thanks for telling me. And then this week they changed their tune. Bro, he was mean this weekend. I was like, hey, the diehard Warriors yeah, fans, yeah. Hey, they, they're there thick and thin through the ups and downs and uh, it's cool man and I just like obviously when the Warriors win the game of rugby league just grows here and the kids and the parents and the you know families all love talking about the Warriors so the good thing about it is what I enjoy is yeah the, when they win yes it's good for the club good for the Warriors but it's also good for the game of rugby league here in New Zealand because everyone just gets involved and gets behind it and yeah so it's just great just being out in the community and seeing the smile on kids faces and parents faces too. Mr. Can you um can you remember another time like this for the Warriors? Like it seems pretty crazy that like the positivity around the team, even after yeah. a record loss, everyone seems to have this belief that the team still has a chance of actually like there's something about this team off the back of last year that just yeah. feels different than previous Warriors sides, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well I think if you're um like doing tipping and fantasy, this is much really the hardest year, I think, for a lot of people out there to be able to pick who's going to win week in, week out. Hey, I don't do it, so if, if, if and you might probably do it. <laughs> but picking like a winner every week, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't put your finger on who's going to win. It'd be a toss of a coin. So I think what is exciting is the competition is so tight and it's such a quality competition that where the Warriors sit on the table, there's still a chance of pushing into the top four. And again, built off the back of last year's performances, has kept everyone engaged in what they've been able to do. They've built up this tribalism and, and this this fan base around, obviously, up the Waz, and it still keeps going. And over in, the, over in, in Australia, they're talking about, has it run its course? It, it's stuck. It's stuck, and uh, the fans are turning up through these tough times. Those fans have always been there, the OGs that have been there from day one. We've just gained a few more fans through the performances. They must really jumped off when they've lost and then come back on. And I think this is what you've got to understand with the Warriors. And this is just how it's been for a long time. Until we can see the Warriors playing consistently in the top four in finals football, it's kind of going to be like this uh, for our fans. And one day it'll all change. Uh, but at the moment, I think... That's what it is. It's built up a, a, a tribalism and, and, a, and a war cry of up the wars is that everyone's just connected to it, eh? It's crazy. You talk about everyone. It's crazy last week at the Gold Coast that 70% yeah. of the fans yeah. were Kiwis, yeah. all Warriors fans, at the Titans' home ground. Yeah. That's the extent of the popularity that the team has garnered over the last couple of seasons. And no, no, I've been away for a long time, but coming back... It's a totally different demographic supporting mm. rugby league in general. And it's been awesome to see the game, not through the Warriors and through the Kiwis winning last year, I, I presume that's played a part in it, but see the game grow and more fans supporting the game and under, not just watching the game, but understanding there's a knowledgeable fan base out there yeah. that knows a thing or two about the game. I sit, sit and the, watch the game sometimes in a pub and... I can hear people talking and they're quite clever about what they're watching. Mm. Or oh, you've got fans and athletes from all over coming now. 
Um, I seen the English yeah, rugby, 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 rugby union yeah. boys there. Yeah. Obviously, all black boys have been turning Dan up. Cardinals, you know yeah, what I mean? I, I think the game and the, the product sells itself, the game, but obviously the experience of what the Warriors have been able to create with the fan base um, that brings and attracts people to it, who obviously had your mate there, the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't know when your, your mates, you know, if we've ever had too many Prime Ministers turn up to a Warriors game of late. Yeah. Um, so when we're doing, when the Warriors are doing something really well, the game of rugby league has grown here in New Zealand, people turn up and that's who we're creating. Yeah. Well, he invited, his, awesome. invited his mates, <laughs> he rocked up and it helped himself to everything. <laughs> shout out yeah. to Oregon. The booze shout included. Out. Shout out to the NRL and the Warriors marketing team too. Like obviously they're doing something yep. that's yep. attracting all these people, you know? Well, the, the game... Gr- the game's growing, the game's exciting. Um, you know, gone are the days where you kick out and try and slow the game down. They're keeping the ball in play for much longer periods because it's a war of attrition. Um, so this is where it becomes a competition. It's tough, it's back and forwards, just big hits, fitness, athletes, and it's who can control the game of rugby league and momentum. And momentum swings all the time in the game, and it's who can control that more often than none. And this is what's attracting fans and people over to the game of rugby league. Yeah, I was was fortunate to be sitting with some of the England Rugby Union coaching staff, and they were watching the game. And obviously, for most of them, it's their first NRL experience. But what got them was the atmosphere. Mm. The atmosphere of the game, and, and that's what it is. It's a fantastic atmosphere, and it's an event Mm. It's an event that in these tough times, financially, people are getting value for money. Yeah, you know, They're getting a return. And the bonus for that return on the entertainment and the atmosphere is the win. So they just keep coming back if the team keeps winning at home. Yeah, loving, loving the fans, man, loving the fans. Can't just leave the game without talking about Mr. Stand On Business, Xavier Willison, <laughs> getting yeah. his, uh, his first start and obviously getting the try as well. Yeah, he's going to be... He's a player that's developing really well um, as a front rower. He'll, he's got international quality in him. Uh, when the time's right, he'll be selected. I think, you know, he can build off what he can do. Close to the line, he becomes a target for the Broncos because he's such, such a big carrier of the ball and he's quite tall. So he scored a lot of tries within, you know, the seven metre near the try line because he can carry people over and he scored a great try. I've seen him score another try like that. He's also scored one of those in the Indigenous game when he was playing for the Maldives as well. So... Um, a big body moves really well. Moves really well for a big body, and you know to have him out on your field when you're playing short. If you've got a nice hooker, like he becomes a target for you, and they use them up a lot close to the line. You know, you've got a bright future. Big body. He scored that try. His feet were still on the ten meter line. <laughs> <laughs> he's massive, big tall thing. <laughs> But yeah, he's, he's going to be a threat. He's growing. He's getting mm. better every single week. And it's nice to see him get a, a starting opportunity and get a feel for what it's like to start a game and impose himself in the absence of someone like Payne Haas mm. and grow and show what he's learning off him. It, he's going to be a great one for a long time. Whose mana wave was better, him or Freddie oh, Lusser? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I like, you know, we've seen Xavier Wilson throw money waves out, eh? But you've never seen someone like Freddie Lussick <laughs> chuck it out there, eh? So I think Freddie Lussick was better only because Chanel was behind him yeah. and also yeah. Adam Pompey who threw one as well. So I think collectively we're stronger than the one. But yeah, it's, um, it's become the thing, bro. Like, you know, I love how our Aussie players are adapting to the culture and the things that happen here in New Zealand because that's what makes the Warriors so cool um, is that our Aussie players, similar to like Mitch Barnett, Kurt Catwell, come in there and want to try and change their names and have a bit of a laugh with it, you know what I mean, to a Māori name or a Samoan name like <laughs> Luke Mekiafu. So, uh, uh, you know what I mean, Luca. So like someone like him, you know what I mean, like it's cool that they're open to adjusting to the culture um, and they're getting amongst it. It's great to see. Can you, um, can you, you had a bit of an interview with the halves at um, the end of the game. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the future of the halves pairings for the Warriors? Obviously, SJ's starting to get older and what this sort of means. Like, what were they talking about at the end of the game? Yeah, there? It, yeah um, a great, had a great chat with those two boys at the end of the game, Tamari and um, Chanel. I think um, they see a game differently as being a little bit younger. They're adapting to the new age of playing football, yes. 
you know, when you're a coach, the structure there is just so that when you get lost, you go to these positions. But at the same time, you allow them to, you've got these kids, you allow them to play the football, but also understand that there's consequences behind what you do. Um, so they, they, they spoke about uh, their background of being both touch players. Uh, and obviously in the game of touches, you have to see where you want to go, but play what you see. And this is exactly what they said. They said they they love the ad lib style of, of, of rugby league in the way that they have got these good players around them, but at the same time that when they do something, there's support for what they do. Um, so they were energetic, they were smiling, they were having a laugh at each other. Um, I just like the connection that these two boys have. Um, you know, when you when you put them on a, on a camera where everyone can see, the public can see, but also they smile and they enjoy themselves, but they're excited about the opportunities that they have, then you know that they're in the right headspace and where they want to go with their game and help this club grow. So I think um, a great little insight to, to how they think as young players. Yes, we spoke about somebody, but he's still young in his career. But these guys, have um, you've got a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to what they want to do but also love their energy with how they want to play and their excitement for the club. Mm. You look at some of the great teams of the past, a big part of their success has been the halves partnership mm. and the connection that they've had. And you go back to the great Raiders side with Laurie Daly and Ricky Stewart and at the same time the Broncos with Kevin Walters and Alfie Langer. You've got uh, Luai and Cleary today. Um who are together, been together for a little while. If Sean does decide to move on and call it a day and this partnership is able to flourish for a little while, this could be the making of mm. a successful period for the Warriors because uh, they're both talented footballers and they're already clicking in sync together and looking mm. dangerous as a partnership. Next game, Knights versus Eels at McDonald's. McDonald Jones Stadium and yeah, McDonald's. <laughs> What'd you have? Car park. <laughs> yeah, 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 McDonald's. Uh, game where the Knights bested the Eels, uh, you could say, and I'm oh, going to say. Uh, nice. But yeah, it was a pretty cracking game as well, like the first game, first couple of games in the week. Yeah, Willie, you jump on this one, Willie. Will, Will Price. Uh, yeah, yeah, young Will. Um, his dad, obviously, Leon, played for a long time and. Uh, was had a massively successful mm. career. I think he played in about eleven grand finals <laughs> over there <laughs> between uh, piece, <laughs> between Bradford and St Helens. He was alright. Eh? What a yeah, piece, playing all over the, the the back line, but made his name as a six and a really talented, different type of athlete to his son. He wasn't as quick as what young Will is, but, so there's a lot of pressure on him to come in. Just cause mum and dad flew out from England to watch the game and. To bag that try early doors was fantastic for him, and he he, uh, he had a really good game. With young Will and people were talking about he could be the the answer to their six point. He's got a lot of games ahead of him to prove himself and find some consistency. Uh, but the Knights <laughs> feel for the Eels. They're in, they're in a they're in a real mm. hole. They're in a real hole. Blaze Talangi scored early doors, but they just look like they're lacking confidence. Mitch Moses had another good game and had a really strong week after his outing yeah. for New South Wales. But, yeah, just tough, tough for them at the moment. They just can't get themselves going. And we're another week into it and still no coach. Still no mm -hmm. coach for them. Mm -hmm. and Still some different names coming up yeah. as favourites. It, it just hangs over the top of them. Yeah. It can't be healthy, healthy or helpful for them. I think that's, that's maybe part of the problem as well, Willie, is that, again, as, as a player, you want to play for a coach. And I... You know that he's not going to be the coach now, uh, but you're wanting to know what the future holds for yourself, not only yourself, but also the club and the direction that they're going into. Um, like you said, Mitch Moses I thought was great. Uh, he tried his best. I like his plays when they put him at the back of you know Dylan Brown and Dylan Brown, the way he played, he scored some nice tries with the speed. His kicking game's always been second to none, his quality at that. But other than that, I just don't think, you know, the leadership through the middle of the pack you know, you've got some big boys there that are origin players that I just don't think they're helping the cause to, to be better or to improve. Um, they have, they've got their best team on the field, I think, close to their best team on the field, but not beating uh, a Newcastle team, who I think, um, you know, 
at, at, at good times, they stand up. Their middles, you know, the, the Saifidi brothers were enormous. They needed to be, you know, the, they've got some halves and they're changing their halves around all the time. They don't have Callum Ponga. They've got a, a mix of everything. They, they rely, obviously, Brandon Bess has been good. Greg Marju has done a good job at the back as well on the wings. So although I think, you know, the Eels have got some star power through the middle of the pack, who, which they do use their power game, I thought they were out-muscled by the Saifidi brothers, Phoenix crossing through the middle of the park just through pure grit and the way that they carried the ball and then allowed the guys like, you know, Braidman best to do his thing out wide and got a couple of breaks and, and put some speed down the sidelines and broke a few tackles. So um, it's a hard one to try and think where the Eels end up going because I don't see them moving too far and you can put more pressure on, you know, Mitch Moses and Clint Gutherson and Dylan Brown, but... They can't do anything if the middle forwards aren't going forward, oh. which shows when your forwards are going forward like the Newcastle team, it allows Hastings and Will to do their thing. Yeah. So, yeah, tough, tough, a tough loss, a good win for the Newcastle Knights and some great performances through the team. Yeah, on paper, by reputation, if mm. anything else, that's a much stronger Parramatta team. You know, that's just not clicking at the moment. Some of their execution was poor at vital moments. They had opportunities late on with the scoreline and only being two or four behind. They throw wayward passes that Bradman Bess pounces on. For a big man, he can run. He can move, eh? Jeez, he can move. A couple of 80-metre runaway tries and then the last one to close the game out. Yeah. That was it for Parra. They were done then. They're just, you know, they're a better side than what they're showing. But because of all the issues that are going off, off the field... Mm -hmm. The people that are running the club have got to take some responsibility for what's happening on the field too, because mm. you know they're not helping the team by having these factors going on mm. that they are in control of. Best stat line is pretty crazy: two tries, three hundred and fifty-seven meters, two line breaks, two try assists, ten tackle breaks, one offload, and zero negative play. Yeah, it was, it was the ten tackle breaks for me because. He's got to beat players to get those things in. I think when he got the ball in hand, I guess the, the line breaks, the the 80 metre runs, you still have to score those tries and you still have to run 80. So that kind of puts your tally up. But beating players as a centre, that's your job. Uh, breaking tackles, being hard to tackle, um, is that, that's, that's right up there with Brian Toto and some of the stuff that mm. he does as a winger. So centres, the best centres are breaking tackles. They're putting pressure on the opposition, not only with his carries, but being them with feet, um, being hard to tackle. And yeah, quality, you know, 357 metres is big, but you know, 10 tackle breaks, I'll take the 10 tackle breaks. And the day. other dude next to him, obviously Greg Marzu last season yeah. was the, I think he had the most tackle breaks in the whole NRL. This season hasn't been quite on the same form. Only had two tries before this game. Mm. But this game, he also got two tries, eight tackle breaks, two 10 metres. They're, they're, they're both hard to tackle because they're so low built to the ground and they make themselves hard. And I think, again, you know, on the back of what Brian Tall does as well, they're quite all similar. Uh, Braden Best is a strong carry for the boys, like a Nick Kotrick style of, of centre, like similar body shape, uh, but can beat people with not only running over the top of them, but gas them and use his feet as well. Just feel for him that... If Latrell wasn't as dominant as he was mm. in that game too, he's probably in the reckoning for a New South Wales left centre spot. But yeah, Latrell's being Latrell and doing what he is because that's a New South Wales quality performance. And he was outstanding in the one origin he played last year in the mm. last game. And now hopefully he gets another game down the down the line and you know in the next couple of years he gets another opportunity to put that jersey on because he is he is origin quality. Um. The Brad Arthur obviously was sacked mm. uh, from the job not that long ago, uh, which is why it's pretty funny that his son Matt Arthur made his debut for the Eels. How, how does that happen? Your your son, you're the coach. Your son is in the team, but he can't get a run. But then apparently he's good enough for the next coach. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, they're trying to find players to get a job done. Now, that's what it is. Is your, I just don't think what they're doing now is actually working. Again, it's an opportunity. I don't know if their pathways are that strong at the moment for the the strong catchment that they have. There's some quality kids through there. There are so many kids to pick from. Um, they're trying to. T I think their nine is mostly the spot that needs to be sorted out. 
um, if they can fix that up and do some things with their middle forwards and around just bloody being leaders, then they will help someone like Brad's son. Um, yeah, well, again, you're, the coach has a little bit of a say on who who, um, who who signs to the club, but again, it's the football managers. But again, he's got a couple of handy kids. Yeah, you don't want to show nepotism, but, you know, the, you, you've got to be convinced by your other staff, you know, f- for your son to get selected. But um, he may have picked up his form since his dad left and pushed for that opportunity the other night. And there were some question marks. Was dad going to go and present the jersey, go in the dressing room and do the jersey presentation? I'm still not sure whether he did it or not. I'm, but I'm surely... The father's got to yeah. proceed and take over from the former coach and go do this as as an, a real special, important family moment. Mm. I remember when his Matt's brother Jake made his debut at Parramatta, did really, really well, and you know, Dad was there obviously as a coach, and how emotional and how proud he was, especially when his son scored on debut and did really well. So that would have been the same. I don't think you can afford to put your pride in the way of you know enjoying those. Memories and making those moments for life. Next game, Storm versus Raiders at Amy Park. 16-6 to the Storm. This was a pretty ugly. Uh, this yeah. was the worst game of the Yeah, week, I, I was going to say it was slow. Um, errors. Errors. Position was poor. Um, yeah, the Storm just find ways, even when it's ugly. And I think they've always been that team, is that whatever happens, even if they play poor, they still seem to find a way. But Canberra Raiders have got some problems. They were they were way off where they should have been. Um, obviously moved, you know, Jordan Rapida to the wing. I think Kaya Weeks was a standout at, at fullback. Um, but even there's some errors around him as well. Um, you know, I just I didn't really enjoy this game to be honest. Um, yeah, I just you just expect I guess you expect more from the the Storm and must be more from the Canberra Raiders with the quality of players that they have, especially through the middle of their forward pack. Um, international origin players through their forward pack. Quali- the halves have been really good. Obviously, Kai Weeks moves to the back. You know, I think Jordan up and not being around the ball. Um, so not really playing too much, but not doing themselves any favour with the way, you know, the, the errors and the things that they did in the game. Yeah, this might sound a bit strange, but as a team leading the competition, they seem really unassuming, the Melbourne mm. Storm. They've not really set the world on fire. Um, they've not blown teams away. Yeah. Uh, but they do what they have to to get the wins. Mm. And uh, I think that's a, a credit to Craig Bellamy and the team that he has, but also a credit to Jerome Hughes and what mm. he's done to lead his team around yeah. to just keep collecting wins week after week. Uh, they're almost... Again, without sounding weird, going under the radar as as the top team of the comp at the moment, because they're not yeah. that team that's standing out. So, geez, they're brilliant at the moment, not yet, but they're doing what they need to. Um, the Raiders are in a hole. We've spoken about that. Um, the moment of the game for me was weeks when he collected the ball from distance, but just how easy he went around. Gas them. Like, oh. Gassed them. You know, Sue was quick. Sue was quick, but he gassed them and. So I couldn't get anywhere near him. So, geez, that Kyle Weeks must be quick. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, again, going back to those moments that Ricky's trying to build for the future. Geez, that's something that he can really be happy about. But, yeah, a couple of uh, incidents for the Raiders. Albert Hupawati, the high tackle, mm. and Elliot Whitehead. A couple of things that they can ill afford to lose any more players. They're just in that much of a hole. Um if they if they want to be serious about making the eight and staying there, they you know, they've got to get everybody around and find some confidence and get themselves back to winning ways because they're way off it. Yeah, it's it's a hard one, and this is you know speaking about how good this competition is is like like you said, Willie. It's you're looking for the most exciting team that's playing really well and sitting at the top of the ladder. You wouldn't say the Melbourne Storm when you watch them is that they play an exciting brand of football. But they still managed to get wins, and I, I I rewind my time back to when I played down there, and we were going really well, and we're winning games. I, I remember hearing everyone saying, "Oh, you know, they just play a boring game of rugby league," you know what I mean? And that was literally everyone's things. But those boring games win competitions, and 
you know, for the fans, you want to see this expansive game of football and guys doing cool things. But when you look at the Melbourne Storm, they just get the work done. Um, no matter how they look or how the game's won, either it's one point or four points or 40 points, they just manage to win the game without doing anything flash. Uh, so, again, it's, it's, like, it's like me now. It's like, but what are they doing yeah. differently to the other team? Well, I think it's their commitment to each other. It's what the, the connection that they have, the, the reliability and the trust in their systems and their processes that no matter who steps in, they get a job done. And it may not look like it's the flashiest game or, you know, they're doing all these cool things. It's they're getting two points. Yeah. And that's how, that's how it is. Yeah, and they'll always have somebody, as everyone does, that's not quite on it every single week. Mm. But more often than not, and I'd, I'll throw out a number, they'll have 80% of their players playing almost at a 7 out of 10 Yeah, every single week, doing what the coach is asking them to, executing their game plan and just doing the things repetitively, what needs to be done in order to win. They don't have to be the 10. Yeah. Well, Jerome's been a 9 for, for a good month or two now, but he's getting the support of everyone around him. The whole point is to get to that, get to the, get to the finals. You know what I mean? It's to get to the eight, and then the competition changes again because it's everyone's. It's open for anyone to win at eight. So no matter how many wins or how it looks getting there, you just got to get to the eight, and then you're a chance. And if you're in the four, even better, you get that second chance. So I think the whole mindset is building for whatever you need to by ticking off these little boxes on that journey to get there. And they're, they're doing that with the, with players being in and out of the team and some of their best players sitting on the sideline. That's what they're getting done. And they're almost playing playoff football. Yeah. That type of footy. Tight. Tight. Defense, High percentages. Yeah, Defence-minded. Squeeze the opposition. Long. Yep, perfect. It's a long season too, you know. Like, yeah. And, and that's how they think. They, they understand that it's a long season and no matter – you know, like you said, if it looks ugly or not, they're winning and they're getting two points. And yes, Craig is critical all the time when he talks about them because yes, they can be better. But in the back of his mind, I, I'm guessing he knows well, we'll take that one any any way it looks, whether it's ugly or not, we'll take the win because we move on to the next week and we've got to go again. Yeah. So long season, but in the right position. That you, You're not complaining when you're sitting at the top of the ladder, that's for sure. Shows good work ethic by the... Um, by across the the board of the Melbourne Storm, right? Oh, it's it's simple. Get your job done and, yeah. you know, everyone gets their job done no matter who it is. You step in, you get a job done. They're not asking for you to do anything more than your job and no one ever does when you're yeah. in a in a in a, uh, any club. But they nail their role close to, a, you know, a seven or an eight yeah. every single week, whoever steps in. Uh, on to yesterday's games, Dragons versus Dolphins at Net Strata Jubilee Stadium. 26-6 to 6 from the Dragons. Kind of surprising how the Dolphins really didn't show up that much in this game. Well, that's how, this is our competition. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I could have said that, you know, if I was tipping, I would have said the Dolphins. I would have honestly said the Dolphins would beat the Dragons. Um because of the style of football they play, but I, I would have said that about the Dolphins before too when they played the Warriors and thought they were going to beat them too just because they're an attacking side of the attacking side when they play their football. Um, but didn't really look like that yesterday. Um, they struggled. You know, I know, you know Cody was in and out. Uh, Zaka Tor was, he, he tried his best. He kicked well. He had a nice little 40-20 trying to change the momentum. He's got a great head on him for a young kid and understands the game rugby league really well. But, I guess credit to the the Dragons. They just they just know how to get it done too. They're they're a team that's a little bit been inconsistent. They had a couple of boys backing up. I thought Jaden Sewell was enormous. Um, he was tough to handle on that side, defensively strong. Um, you know, I think Max Plath has been. Uh, um, you know, I think he's a Queenslander too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's tough. Like for a little fella, just get stuck and he's got good technique under the ball. He can play hooker and passes well both ways. But he's strong through the middle of the pack. Like, man, he might be someone to have a look at for 
um, Billy Slater for Origin. I think, you know, he would not let you down. Bit of a smaller body, though, but hey. He's gets, like Connor Watson. Gets, he used to play 5'8". Does I think, he? I think Holy so. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he, he's got skill and, and he's tough, too. That's what I like about him. He's tough. So he worked really hard. I thought, you know, the middle forwards of the Dragons went after the, the Dolphins. Wasn't the most exciting game to start off with. It was in the, you know, it was, what is it, 6 0 at half time or close to it. There wasn't too yeah. many points scored. <laughs> yeah. So you're waiting for something to happen and nothing really was happening. But again, a bit of ball possession, a bit of uh, errors from the Dolphins. You know, Ben Hunt put them in the position to try and take the game away and they got it. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, Shane Flanagan said at half time of his 200th game at, at NRL level and charge, but it worked. He got his team rolled up because I thought in the second half they were physical. They just ran harder. I thought Jaden Sewer was a really physical, you know. There was a moment there where he, uh, I'm not quite sure who carried the ball. I think it was maybe might have been uh, Trey Fuller, and just drags him into touch. Yeah. You know the tackle was done, but he just determined to kill the play. Moses Sully had one in the first half where he, they just had an attitude about him and had a grittiness to get the job done and overpower their opposition. For the Dolphins to have got anything out of this, they needed to match that, but they were flat. Yeah. They were flat, if anything. And uh, I thought all three back rowers, again, for the for the Dragons, Luciano Leilua, Jaden Sua, and Raymond Faitala Mariner, have been very, very good. There was a moment there, it looked like uh, Jaden Sua was playing centre, and, and yeah, Faitala was, Mariner yeah. was playing back row. Left side. So but having them both together, really dangerous. But he's he put the disappointment of origin behind him to to be almost the best player on the park, I thought, Jaden Sewer on the weekend. But a real good sign for the Dragons. Um, Herbie Farmworth gets on a loose ball, he grumbles it a couple of times, picks it up and almost gets a try. I think the time was clicking away. It would have been too much for the Dolphins to come back. But that didn't matter to Moses Sully. He raced all the way over from the other side of the field to just get enough on mm. Herbie Farmworth to drop the ball yeah. and not score the try. That's a real strong indication for where Shane Flanagan's got his team, that they're not giving up on plays, that someone like Moses Sully, who probably wouldn't have done that in years gone yeah, by. definitely. He's got himself in a fit position, but also fit in his head to want to do everything to, to die for the team almost, you know what I mean? To not give up on the play, to force that error and get full reward. Herbie Farnworth may have just fallen over, but he still worked hard on the play and not gave up on it, as I said. So that's a real strong indication of where they are as a team and where they're going to go forward. They've just snuck into the eight now. So who, who knows? Who knows if they can go on a run or not? And they could be a very dangerous team on the back of Ben Hunt and Kyle Flanagan. And the Dolphins are doing a bit of the opposite recently. I think they're, they've lost three out of their four last mm. games as well. They're down at sixth, I think, in the table and only two points ahead of the Dragons. So, uh, But even worse news for them, obviously, with the loss is the injury to yeah. JMK. Ankle injury. Yeah. Is that is, He's been injured before, is it? it, is it uh, is yeah, it was shoulders injured? before. Oh, okay. Shoulders before, so an ankle. An yeah, ankle it didn't look injury. good at the boot. Yeah. It's never good seeing someone in a boot like that. He, and he's been a key part to the Dolphins and, and their performances and when they've been winning, the, what he can create with that ball, the deception that he has, is also his running game. Uh, so, yeah, they'll have to find someone to fill that, fill that void. Sweet. Moving to the next game, which is the Panthers versus the Cowboys at Bluebet. And it was kind of like a reverse from their first game this season where... The Cowboys were really good uh, in attack, but their defense just crumbled. It was the opposite. Their defense was solid for the whole yeah. game, kept the Panthers to six points. They can be proud of themselves for that. Uh, and, yeah, their attack wasn't anything too flash, but they got the job done. Yeah, I think um, on the Penrith Panthers, they, they miss Jerome Luai and, and his organization. There was that many times... I think Penrith were running shape and the timing was way off. I guess the the problem is is when you have someone there that's all there all the time who is a leader who plays at their high level consistently week where everyone else knows their role and gets their job done. I thought there was even times there where Yo was running in front of players and it was just it just looked unorganized and attacked. Um, you know, a couple of young fellows who are 
I, I think looked like more of runners than organizers in the team. And every time they caught the ball, they nearly looked like just to run, run all the time. Um, which then, when they went to go and pass, the, org the the shape and the structure outside them was the timing was all way off. They tried hard, the Penrith Panthers, with what they had. They had a real inexperienced pairing in the half. So had a couple of leaders through the middle of the park. Yo, maybe. I think they maybe should have simplified their attack with those guys and maybe just played a lot off Yo and his the way that he carries the ball and the way that he can play. So structurally, may have been able to simplify it. But again, you're not having Yo for the whole week of training. They've, he would only have come back a couple of hours or a couple of days and have to try and get on the field yeah. and try and build connections. So I just thought they were way off structurally and their timing was, their inconsistency of their timing was poor from something that you don't see from the Penrith Panthers. But again, like you said about the Cowboys, defensively, like turned up. Um, that's what they, I guess they built the start of the competition with. They were, they were, they could score lots of tries and then they could defend really well. And they come up against an understrength Penrith team, but got a job done. I thought they were good. Kyle Felt, massive, big boy, hard to handle, can score tries. Yeah, I, talking about Penrith being off timing was, I thought they were playing a lot flatter than what they normally do. You know, they usually play with a bit of depth and get that timing right, but different halves, different opportunities, play different schemes, I suppose. But, yeah, that's uh, they'll be looking forward to getting Jerome Luai back out there. They need him in the absence of Nathan yeah. Cleary even more so. You know, he's, he makes it all work, predominantly the left side, but he can organise things on the right too and tell the other half where to be and help Dylan Edwards. And they're big losses, those, those guys out there. But opportunities still. Young Casey McLean yeah. took his opportunity for the Panthers. Some more young people coming through their system, jumping in, taking their opportunities, but take nothing away from the Cowboys. So drink water was special again. They set up a really good try to Kyle Felt with the long ball. Um, I think that's uh, his 10th try of the year. Nine years in a row now, mm -hmm. I think, that mm -hmm. he's scored 10 tries. Yeah. I think Manu did it Manu, 10, yeah. Manu 10 did out of 10. 10 yeah. So, yeah, Definitely see how he goes yeah. next year. He made a break uh, from distance. <laughs> Didn't quite have the legs Kyle felt that he used to have, but, yeah, close to the line, he's still as dangerous as ever. But, and Braden uh, Burns, he scored on the other edge in the absence of Murray Talangi. So, uh, yeah, they can, in the absence of this, their big names, trust that there's some second-tier or some backups that are ready to go for them. Because this was the Cowboys' best game for the season. That first half in particular, that was as, as good as they've gone all season for me. Uh, they, they backed up their D with some rewarding offence. Their, their challenge is to be consistent. Mm. They've got to try and do that every single week and not just be a one-off, especially when those origin players do come back, the likes of Cotter and Murray Talangi and Deard, and when they're back into it. Uh, they've got to show that they can back that up and go on a bit of a run. That's that's a challenge for every team, but them especially who know that they can do it against Penrith, regardless of who they're pu they're putting out or rolling out in the, on in the jerseys. And especially they had two yellow cards in the in the first half, the Cowboys yeah. as well. And yeah, yeah. Still kept out the, yep. the then, Panthers yeah, then, so for the most part. So they had to work really hard. That, that's Jordan McLean's brother, Jesse. Yeah. Oh, Casey. Sorry. Yeah. And Jesse too. Jesse. He, yeah. he Jesse would have been playing, Jesse. but he had a head knock yeah. in under 19's oh, origin. I'll put all, put all three of them in the Māori's team. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora, brothers. Yeah. Kia ora, my brace. Um, Fish. Shot Willie. Yeah. That's his dad. <laughs> Fish played 66 minutes. Yeah. So maybe a bit of a um, sort of preview of what he might be doing at the Warriors, because I assume he's going to play more than – he usually plays around 40 minutes at the Panthers. Well, I think he needed they needed his leadership out there, and when he carried, he was strong with his carries. He was dominant with his carries. They just didn't have enough around him to help him. Um, I thought he was strong with what he did in those 66 minutes. Every time he carried the ball, it was hard to handle. Um, so, yeah, I think that's normally – I reckon that's Fisher's um, minutes. is about 60 minutes. I think he's he, he can get good quality out of Fish, 30 each side of the half, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that, that's some strong quality leadership that you need and the way that he carries, like he, he demands people to get in front of him. So he's a leader. They needed someone through the middle of the park to lead and that's, that's where they left him on a little bit longer. There's also – there could also be an element of you coach the long game. You coach through the course of the season. They're coming to the back end now to the stretch where they need them out there. Where, all right, we've conserved enough minutes. 
we'll go from that 40 whatever mm. we'll try and get out to 50 plus and get him out there and it'll be interesting to see the back end of the season how much he's playing and how long they can leave him out there because yeah, I do think him and Moses and Normally play quite big minutes. Eh? Yeah. They do quite. They do play big minutes. So between them, they're, they're good carriers of the ball and got big engines on them. So it, I guess it all depends on the game and how the game's moving, how much position you have in the of the ball, and if you're tired under fatigue, then that's when the interchanges get a little bit shorter. But other than that, I think yeah, no, he's it may be a build up to where he needs to get to because he's only coming back from the knee stuff and the injuries. Yeah. There, you know what I mean. So I think yeah. Maybe something that they're looking forward to down the down the track, bigger minutes. We'll head on to the last game of the of the week. Uh, the Roosters running right against the Tigers, forty to six. I mean, as we said earlier about the two yellow cards, specifically, yeah. you know, the uppy one, same as the Roger yeah. one last week, yeah. just kind of ridiculous. And it obviously didn't help the Tigers with that end score line. Well, they always find something the Tigers to get themselves in the in the bin. Eh? That's been a bit of a, a thing for them. But again, when you look at the the Roosters, they had everything to play for. Um, three milestones: Tedesco 150 for the club, uh, 300 for their coach, and then the biggest one I think of for for the weekend was Jared 306. You know, he kept there with. Uh, Orbison, Orbison, who's on 306, who will now, I think, uh, on the back of this performance, he will go to the all-time games played for the Roosters, which is a massive achievement when you think about how big the Roosters are and who have come through then, who have played for that club. Like, this is cr- cool for a New Zealand player yeah. too. Like, I'm happy because he's a New Zealand player. And when New Zealand players do great things in the game and can break records, I think it's awesome. Uh, it's an awesome achievement. So he will keep going until he finishes up at the end of the year and he will be the all-time, you know, Roosters players. And I don't think there'll be too many others that will get close to what he's been able to, what he'd be able to do. So he'll be all right up there on the honours board all through the Sydney Roosters and what they've been able to achieve in their, in their club history as a legend, as a legend of the club. Um, people love what he brings on the field, bit of a larrikin off the field, a loud mouth, big head. Um, but you put him on the field and you cross that white line, there's, there's no one else you want to stand next yep. to when you go to war with someone on the field, and that's Jared. So, you know, a massive game from, from the Roosters. I think, you know, obviously with those yellow cards in the end, they ran away with it. Um, I think the biggest injury news out of there was Joey Manu. I thought he was terrorising that left edge of the Tigers with his feet and the way he carries the ball um, and then may have fractured his wrist or something. Mm. I'm unsure I heard the different. crack in the, yeah. in the TV, yeah. like when yeah. they, you know what I mean? I was like, oh, gee, that is loud. So, you know, sad for Joe Manu um, because I thought he was dominating that that right edge or the left edge of the um, of the Tigers. They were under so much pressure. Uh, obviously, Walker's been enormous uh, with his kicking game and how tough he is, Luke Carey, and then obviously Tedesco playing one of, I think, his best games this season. Uh, being busy around the middle of the park, he's always there to support. But, you know, they were they were clinical and just grinded the, the Tigers out of the game pretty much. Went after them defensively, suffocated them in, in defence and then went after them in attack. And uh, as also wrote, and the scoreline speaks for itself. Yeah, it might not reflect numbers-wise, but they're close to the best attacking team in the comp. Now, when they execute their plays, as opposed to what Penrith were in the weekend, these guys know where to be. Their timing is so clinical, and they put people like Daniel Tupo and uh, Dom, the, Young. Dom Young. Dom Young. Sorry, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> they put Dom Young. They just walk in. You know, they run and tries in acres of yeah. space. Because everybody knows their role. Their lead runners hit their lines. Um, Walker, Carey run their plays. And, of course, they've got Tedesco who links up as well. But that try that Tedesco set up for Daniel Tupo where he just taps it on. You know, the timing, the skill, the execution of what they do. They've got scrum plays. They've got set pieces that they run. But in general play, when they get to their points, they know what plays are coming. And they do it almost like in training. And against the side that unfortunately for the Tigers reverted back to being individuals again. They just picked holes in them. There was, I'm not sure what their defensive system is or what they were trying to do, but they were all over the shop. 
a couple of plays when the Roosters were attacking, there were people fanning backwards, mm. wingers coming up and trying to kill from too far back. The one guy would shoot out, two guys would shoot out. They just weren't in sync at all. It, even defensively, I thought they were their outside backs were real tight to each other. I was watching those kickoffs and I could hear the commentary saying, hey, if the Roosters just put on a shift, I think their winger was nearly on the post, you know what I mean? So I was like, and then at times they're, they're either tight, they're not, they're too far apart. I'm just like, again, like you said, like what is their defensive structures or systems? Because I don't think, it, it didn't look like a, a normal type of defensive systems that are, no, well, other clubs would have. And when you get into chaotic situations, you refer back to what your defensive system is supposed to be. So when the Roosters made a break late in the game, and Connor Watson goes down mm. the right hand side, doesn't pass it to Dom Young, gets tackled. They go two passes, and Luke Carey, with all his vision, because the wing is so far in, mm. Tupo's got acres of space, just kick the ball. He could have caught it and stood there for 10 seconds before he put it down. Such was the space that he had. But that's their system that they're falling back to. So, yeah, as, as well as being individual again and their approach to defend, uh, along with the discipline issues that they showed, yeah, they've, they took about three steps backwards for me for what they've been the last couple of weeks, unfortunately, it, the Tigers. It, it normally happens when you get under a bit of pressure. You fall back to old habits. Um, old <coughs> habits are trained out of through the pre-season and through the season, but in the season they've much more fallen back and then took, taken a step forward and then gone back again. So it's going to take a while for them to be able to break these habits. But like you said, when they get under fatigue, it's memory bank. It's just where you go back to. So yep. if you were, if you're used to defending nice and tight, like and you come up against a quality site like the Roosters, I think he had 30 metres from um, himself to, both to to the winger. And, yep. you know, the kick was perfectly put on there. But you have to – the kick has to be executed as well. But with that much space and time, he most probably could have let the ball bounce and hopefully bounce into his hand and still scored the try without anyone even being in distance of him. So it's a system that they need to work out real quickly that when times get tough is – what does that look like for us defensively as a team? What do we want to revert back to? Because I'm sure you don't want to revert back to what they showed when times got tough on the weekend. And like we've said all the time is when they've been under pressure, they've gone and tried to defend individually and try and st stop things as a as, as one, but rather than do it as a group, I think that's what the, the hardest thing for the Tigers to do is that they need the 13 on the field to work together as a group. And I'm guessing they know this, but under fatigue, under pressure, when you're coming up against a quality side, that's what holds your line together is the commitment that you do make for each other when you're at training, when you're in tough situations. So some work-ons there for sure. Yeah, and you know, you've got to give them some credit. They fought to 79 and a half minutes till they mm. scored that try right at the end. You could see the disappointment on the Roosters' faces. And they would have liked to finish the game with the big duck egg next to the Tigers' names, but that wasn't to be. So credit to the Tigers for uh, scoring that try, but because they conceded so many, they find themselves at the bottom of the table again, which, you know, they've, uh, if Parramatta get a win or two, it could be tough for the Tigers to get out of that position. What you were saying about um, players needing to play time together, you know, pre-season and all that sort of stuff, um, there's a lot of young players in that back line as well that really haven't had a lot of time playing with each other. How much does that obviously contribute, especially when you're under pressure, you don't really know the system as well as some of these other guys. So you revert back to maybe what you learn in your juniors or you just yeah. rely on your own natural skill. Yeah, well, that's the, the key with pathways, eh, is every team, say your Harold Match, your SG, your 21s, your New South Wales Cup, all should be on the same system. So then when... A player comes up from SG Ball or New South Wales Cup, then they already understand what the systems are. So important that it's all coached through the grades. That's how pathways work. Mm. Hence, obviously, Penrith, people come in, get the job done. Uh, all those good clubs, the Mount Soma, I know they've got a, a 21s team, but you come in there, you, you learn the system. Back in the day, I think they had 20s down there. Those guys were trained and coached exactly the same as the NRL team. So your likes of uh, Kevy Proctor, Jesse Bromages, they all come through um, and they've already learnt everything the NRL team is doing, so they just fall into the systems and know what it is. Um, again, these guys come in, but they haven't had reps at that high level. 
Uh, so you, you're debuting kids. Um, yes, some of these kids would have played together, but now you're coming up against the best of the best week in, week out consistently. consistently. So you're going to have to work it out real quickly. But again, when it comes to defence, it, it's a mindset thing of the team. You've got to all want to do it. You've all got to want to do it. So they can have one person wanting to do it or three or four, but it takes a 13 to defend well as a group because if one does a good hit one time, someone else breaks and they break breaks the tackle, gets through there, and then everyone's just jumping on, everyone just gets sloppy and messy. So it's a connection, but it's time reps at that high level consistently. Yeah, when you're in a hole like this as a coach, this is when you earn your money. This is the real challenge. And it's nice when you're winning and you're going on a roll, but when you, your team's not performing as you would like and you, you're not picking up the wins, that's when you challenge as a coach. And this is when you've got to earn your money. This is when you've got to really coach players. Now, the challenge for, for Benji and his young coaching staff with, with Farrah and Hyington, um, they've got to rely on John Morris as mm. the more experienced coach to take these young guys that are coming in and pass on some of their experience and teach them how things need to be done at this level. You know what I mean? Mm. Because there's so many of the young guys, you've got to try and get them in sync, but also bring them up to speed with what's required at NRL level. Because mm. it's totally different to, to cup. It's totally different. You're going up against a totally different type of beast at NRL level, especially when you play playing to the Roosters. You know, you come up against nothing like James Tedesco at reserve grade level. So then... The gap is that wide yeah. that your coaching needs to prepare them and get them ready for that challenge. Uh, Connor Watson <clears throat> had to, uh, was forced to go into the centres for Joey Manu when he went off. Man, that guy can really literally play in every position, it seems like to me. He's, he's played hooker and lock most of the season. He used to play 5'8". I saw when he was younger he was a fullback, <laughs> and now he's he shifts into centre and takes 18 carries for 192 metres. Like, this guy's just, that's that blue blood, you know. <laughs> that's, uh, that must be what it is. Yeah, well, I guess what what's, what saves him is obviously his versatility, but his leg speed. So he, like, we, I talk about, like, centres are a tough position to defend in. Um, obviously not up against a quality side, and they hit, they were down on confidence. They lost like, a few men at the end there. But you, you've got to play with what's in front of you. He's good because he, he's small, but he's quick on his feet and he, he defends through the middle of the park. So defensively, you're not going to miss much defensively. Um, his leg speed's really good. Uh, he can break tackles, and I think that's what saves him a lot. I think he's so versatile. Yes, he can play anywhere from the halves to the middle to the centres now. I don't think he'll go wing. Um, but I think he's he's a quality player to have in your side that you cannot have not have him in the side, if that makes sense. So... Yeah, a great, great outing for him yeah. and off the back of Origin. Didn't play big minutes, but comes out and performs the way he does, which is great. Yeah, and I'll touch back to some of the coaching. He knew what his responsibility and his job was mm. when he was defending in that position. He can play those positions athletically and he knows the game. But there was a play when the Tigers had a short side of about 20 metres and the Roosters only had... Two there, I think there was Connor Watson and Dom Young, yeah. and a really big three space. But he knew not to jam, he knew not to get out of sync. And him and Dom Young, it was almost like yeah. they were holding hands, they were defending the same system until the ball moved, and then they went and killed the two on two and cut the play down. They had to concede 10 or 15 metres, but from halfway, it didn't matter. Mm. The point I'm trying to make is he understood and was coached to perform his system, mm. even though he's probably only trained at hooker. And halfback, he's watched what everybody else is doing. He knows what the system is. He's observed what everybody else's role is because I'm a utility. I've got to know just in case. So when he got out there, because of the coaching that was being done with him, he knew how to perform his role in that one-off scenario. He, he must have the hardest role. I think a utility player has the hardest role to understand what it is you've got to do because if when you're doing footage, you're... If he can cover centre, you're watching the other centre, you're watching the middle of the park, and you're also covering in the halves. So he's got so much to know and understand yeah. as a utility player that you forget the value of these guys that can do these things because to be able to, like you said, understand the, 
the systems in the Roosters systems are out defending on short sides, but then to be able to carry the ball through the middle of the park and then also play in the halves. Like you also got to know what you know the fullback where he positions himself, who's the kicker, all these kind of things, and then the centres who you're marking up against, who you might be marking up against, what work that what does he like doing? Right foot, left foot, right hand carry, left hand carry, like all these things. There's so much. He needs to look at footage and vision-wise to make sure that he can execute his job. But again, they obviously have a really good system that he just gets and understands. Yeah, such an important role, that yep. that 14. Hence why I believe that the Daily in Team of the Year needs to have some benches in it. Because mm. it's a 17-man game now. Yeah. And the bench needs to be in there. They, they have such an impact. Yep. We go best props, best 1 to 13. Mm. But the 15, 16, 14, they're important. Yeah. They have a massive impact on the game. Yeah, There's definitely. some people that are really special at it. He's well, one of them. Well, they specialise in that position. Like, that's their position, the 14. Like, they, they're not in the team, but they're just as important to the team because of what their versatility is and what they can deliver. So that 14 role is a key Huge. to any team in the competition, and it goes unrecognised because the amount of work they've got to do to understand what's happening on the field in every single position that they cover. Last thing before we uh, are done up with all the games, uh, Jared obviously said his massive accolade of the games most played tied up now. But I also just want to thank him for giving us our biggest video <laughs> because our Instagram reel about him being the king of the back fence oh, has yep. over 100,000 views. So wow. he really can do it all. He can even help a poor little YouTube channel like uh, run it straight <laughs> to get massive views as well. Shout out to Jared. So, so we're shouting out to Jared Shout again. Jared. Yeah, man, thanks, I've given Jared. that many raps over this <laughs> since I've finished that bloody hell. <laughs> You're the man, Jared. Fire out. Um, before we kick on, like going back to Joey Manu in the centres, he might be out for a little while. Um, Month. Who do you think is going to slip into that role? Do you think they'll try and put Connor Watson in there or we got a young guy that you think would probably take that spot? No, I think they'll leave Connor Watson where he is because he's, like we said, he's that valuable to the team. Um, he can cover other positions as well. So I think they'll bring a young kid in. Um, they, they would have, who have they had there Yeah, before? Billy Smith's yeah. out. Uh, Sua so Lee and Ponga are both suspended. Yeah. Jennings, Jennings, Jennings is injured yeah. Jennings. with his hamstring. Oh, what the hell? No. That's like every centre yeah, well, that's, team. Well, yeah. they, they, have, they have a problem. They've, they've got yeah. obviously yeah. their, their centre position, and I heard them speaking about last night, that this is where all the injuries are at the minute. So... Yeah. They may be makeshifting, um, sh shifting around. Well, I, I think like they've they used uh, Siwa Wong yep. in yeah. the centres, so they they could they might call him back up. Or well, Satili just the, stays out there. Well, Satili so will yeah. be on the what, left, what, and yeah. they use Wong on the right. But <laughs> so they have four back rows. Right. So you know, rows. Angus Crichton. Yeah, like, you know what I mean. Like he's covered that position. Like he would be strong in that position as well. So they may only have to use him for a couple of weeks. Um, I think they may have one more game and then a bye. So get through this week, uh, have a buy, and then maybe you get one of your centers back. So that might be the way they go. You just yeah. make shift one of their back rowers. Me. Yeah, so that, that was mean. Anyway, Fano, that's another beautiful episode of the game Rugby League. So much to dive into there and have a little listen, a watch. Uh, Origin Warriors every single game from the weekend. Make sure you tune in on all our social media channels. YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, tell all your friends and on our social Instagram and all those kind of things. So make sure you tune into this one up this afternoon. Let's go. Cool.